All right, I'd like to call this meeting to order at 6.30. We will begin with a land acknowledgement. The City of Medicine Hat acknowledges that we live and work on treaty territory. The city pays respect to all Indigenous people and honors their past, present, and future. We recognize and respect their cultural heritages and relationships to the land. Item number four is a moment of prayer or reflection. All right, so we'll move on to item 5.1, adoption of the meeting minutes from March 18th, 2024. Are there any errors or omissions? Okay, um, seeing none, the meeting minutes are adopted as presented. Item 5.2 is adoption of the meeting minutes from the special council meeting on March 24th, 2024. Um, are there any errors or omissions? Okay, seeing none, the meeting minutes are adopted as presented. Okay, so now item number six, adoption of the agenda. Are there any additions or revisions? Okay, with that, um, seeing none, the agenda is adopted as presented. Number seven is councillor announcements. Do any councillors have announcements they would like to share? Councillor yes, Grogan. I do, thank you. <clears throat> Through the chair, um, I want to, uh, on behalf of Council, I want to take this opportunity to thank the citizens of Medicine Hat who engaged the Canadian Armed Forces and the Minister of National F Defence to save the Southern Alberta Light Horse in Medicine Hat and its subordinate, subordinate troop in Lethbridge from being given to a Calgary regiment. Medicine Hat has been the home for over a century to the Sally Horse and its predecessor units who fought in both world wars through terrible battles in places like Vimy Ridge and Normandy. Well over 200 Sally Horse soldiers also served in peacekeeping operations and helped fight fires and floods in Canada. In 2013, 27 local soldiers filled the sandbags that saved our water treatment and power plants from being flooded when all other reservists were being sent to help Calgary. We had our own soldiers from our own regiment here when they were needed. A special thank you to the Minister of National Defence, the Honourable Bill Blair, for his ministerial investigation into the plan to change the home of the regiment. Unfortunately, the plan has not been fully defeated as Medicine Hat and its troop in Lethbridge, although remaining part of the Sally Horse in name only, now fall under the oper operational command of that Calgary unit. We are hopeful that the minister will direct his team to undo this plan and fully return the Southern Alberta Light Horse in Medicine Hat and Medicine Hat and Lethbridge back under the command of the uh, Southern Alberta Light Horse and by properly resourcing recruiting to grow the regiment back to its former strength of 195 soldiers from just four years ago. Medicine Hat is a strong and vibrant city and like many cities <clears throat> our size across Canada, like many cities of our size across Canada, Medicine Hat has proven its ability to be a supportive home for an Army Reserve Regiment during war and peacetimes, and the benefit of the regiment in this geographically isolated area of the province has been proven over and over, not to mention the importance of the identity and culture of Medicine Hat. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grogan. Um, are there any additional Councillor announcements? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to the consent agenda. Would anyone like to pull any items from the consent, consent agenda for discussion? Okay, so I'm looking for a motion to adopt the consent agenda as presented. I'll move that. Okay. I'll second. Okay, um, we will vote on the consent agenda. That is unanimous. Okay, so um, just to my fellow councillors, before we get moving, I want to make a gentle reminder that we have a very large agenda in front of us. If you can be mindful of this, we're going to be uh, hopefully moving through each item as timely as possible. Um, 
All right, item number nine, public hearings. Our first item is bylaw 4808 to amend the land use bylaw to resume, re rezone the 800 block of 2nd Street Southeast as medium density residential district. Um, I call this public hearing to order at 6.35 p.m. We have Robert Sissons, manager of planning here to give us an introduction to this item. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Robert Sissons. I'm the manager of planning, and I'm here to present bylaw 4808, uh, land use bylaw amendment for the rezoning of the 800 block of 2nd Street Southeast uh, to medium density residential district. So, this is just a, a brief overview of the presentation for today. So the site is located in the northwest portion of the River Flats neighborhood. Uh, the surrounding area context consists of public land uses with the Medicine Hat Remand Center and the Medicine Hat uh, Police Services Station to the north of the site. And that's depicted in the light blue on the map. Uh, the old arena site and the Medicine Hat Curling Club are further to the northeast, commercial businesses uh, across the west uh, of Maple Avenue and primarily low density residential land uses to the south and southeast. The site is currently used as a parking lot by the police uh, service and the City of Medicine Hat Land and Real Estate Department has negotiated a alternative parking location for the Medicine Hat Police Services offsite. The primary access to the site is from 2nd Street. Additional access to the site is available from Ash Avenue or the rear lane. The site is adjacent to Maple Avenue Southeast, which is an arterial roadway. The nearest transit stops are directly across the site on the north side of 2nd Street in front of the police station, and then there's several others along Maple Avenue as well. And the site is within walking distance to many amenities and can be accessed by multiple modes of transportation. So the line use bylaw amendment is for the rezoning of the subject site from community services district to medium density residential district. So the intent of the rezoning is to allow the land and real estate department to obtain council authorization to sell the lots and ultimately receive a future development proposal that aligns with the vision of the municipal development plan. The land is currently vacant as mentioned and the lots are currently being consolidated. The site has previously gone through two technical coordinating committee circulations for review and comment uh, regarding the proposed land sale. Uh, the one, one concern was the, the parking issue for the police services, but which has been resolved. And the other one was the limited electric capacity for this location. So any proposed development would have to work with electric distribution to discuss any options for electrical service. So there's no other major concerns that were flagged. Rezoning the site to medium density residential district to accommodate future development is supported by council strategic plan. So 1.9 directs administration to actively pursue opportunities to remove obstacles to success, innovation and incremental development while ensuring regulatory compliance. And 6.8 directs administration to maximize infill and brownfield development and revitalization of existing areas, including by implementing the brownfield redevelopment strategy. So multiple unit housing is strongly encouraged in the downtown area to create a critical mass population and to take advantage of existing services. So this slide provides a brief overview of the financial impact uh, a medium density residential use could have on the site. So I'll just note that these are estimates, uh, but the actual numbers could vary significantly based on what the final proposal is. Um, but pulling data from tax assessments, uh, we can determine that the value of the vacant site is, is 765,000 uh, currently, which gives it a value per hectare of about 1.7 million. And then you can see a review of comparable developments in the River Flats neighborhood indicates that development of the site with attached housing, so that's row houses and townhouses, could result in a value per hectare of between eight to 16 million. And development of the site with uh, apartment could result in the value per hectare of between 10 to 30 million. 
So medium, dens medium density residential development on the site will contribute to that significant increase in the tax base from the redevelopment of the site. So starting with, uh, I'm just going to do a little bit of a policy review, um, and I'll just note that we have three rezonings here tonight, and a lot of the same policy context I'll go over in the first one, and then I'll, I'll try and more briefly summarize it for the second and third one. So starting with the municipal development plan policy, uh, you can see the urban transect model uh, from the MDP which demonstrates eight different typologies. So the urban transect is a tool that can be used to determine at a very high level the varying built environment characteristics which are best suited for any given area with a long-term aim uh, of financial sustainability. So this site is located within the city centre sector and typologies which typically apply to the sector include natural and open space, general urban, urban villages and corridors and urban core and special use. So within the city centre sector, this site is identified as part of the urban core typology, which is a major intensification node. The urban core is a compact area which functions as the downtown and adjacent areas and a mix of residential and commercial buildings that are taller and more dense, pedestrian-oriented design uh, with entertainment and civic buildings are, are typical components of this type of an area. So the star on the map shows the location of the subject site within the city centre sector and urban core typology. So in this next section, uh, I'll go through some of the guiding policies relevant to this proposal. So section 3.1, vibrant downtown, uh, indicates that downtown should evolve over the long term into a higher density mixed use district that provides desirable opportunities for urban living, entertainment and destination retail. And within that guiding policy too indicates one of the desirable future land uses for the downtown area to be residential. And policy three states that the importance of blending traditional local building styles and materials with quality modern design and new developments. So going forward, guiding policy four is to create a critical mass of population that will support businesses, services, and public amenities. Uh, and the density of dwellings should be substantially increased. To, to achieve this, new, resident, new residential development should be configured as mixed-use buildings, wherever possible, be designed as multi-story buildings, and contain a diverse range of residential types and varied forms of ownership. So in section 3.2 of the MDP, it's, it's called livable neighborhoods. So, and I've included this as um, the site is right on that threshold of the urban core and then the more historic neighborhood of the urban core, um, or sorry, the more historic neighborhood of the river flats. So it's just kind of right on the edge. So I've included policies here as well. But neighborhoods should be cohesive uh, with an appropriate structure of land uses and densities. Policy two uh, talks about that medium density or high density residential should be located on the perimeter of the neighborhood along a major street. Guiding policy five outlines that neighborhoods should include a variety of housing types and designs that support our shifting demographics and family structures, all ages and abilities, specifically with adequate provision for accessible and visitable housing and a variety of income levels and ownership structures. And then lastly, energized infill. So a balanced approach to accommodating a portion of our population growth through infill development is encouraged. So basically the more we can accommodate within our existing urban service areas, the better chance we have at ensuring long-term financial sustainability of the city. Concentrating major projects primarily within the downtown area and then our three other urban villages. So that uh, these areas are naturally more suited to accommodating increases in density. And then a benefit of an increased level of infill is the tempering of greenfield growth. So that furthers the objective of delaying capital infrastructure expenditures in the city's outer areas. So the less new infrastructure we have to bring online basically equates to lower perpetual financial obligations we have per capita. And then 
policy, uh, priority five outlines the importance of establishing uh, an urban redevelopment process that is financially feasible, predictable, and results in a net positive experience for neighborhoods. So in policy three, clearly outlines that the city should actively assist and engage in urban redevelopment projects by actively acquiring, consolidating, and preparing land parcels for redevelopment, either internally or through the private sector. So the next uh, tier down from policy planning, I know this is a lot, but this, this area has gone through a lot of planning over the years, uh, is the River Flats Area Redevelopment Plan. So that's more specific to that neighborhood. So the site is within the boundaries of the River Flats Area Redevelopment Plan, which is a statutory plan. The site is situated in what the ARP identifies as the Old Town neighborhood, which is intended to be primarily for public service and residential uses. The site is specifically intended for public service uh, in the initial land use concept, but the proposal for multi-unit housing uh, development is still supported by the ARP as it aligns with one of the major principles of the ARP as well as several policies. Um, so typically what happens uh, an MGA recently was updated that does provide that clarity when there is a conflict between let's say an MDP and an area redevelopment plan. And in this case, the MDP policies would prevail. But section 2.2 does uh, indicate that redevelopment and growth that enhances the community's diversity and amenities is encouraged. Um, and then 3.4 talks about uh, two policies that does support this rezoning that says, ensure that development supports the sense of place for the neighborhood by produce, providing sensitive integration of land uses and high quality intensification. And then number six also says supporting comprehensive multi-dwelling residential and community amenity development along the river. So the old arena site and curling rink area along 2nd Street Southeast between Maple Avenue and Allowance Avenue and within the local com neighborhood commercial node. And then finally, uh, from the regulatory perspective, the land use bylaw, um, this proposal to rezone the site to medium density residential uh, to accommodate a future development it does align with the purpose of the district and is compatible with the surrounding land uses. So that purpose is to allow for the development and moderate intensification of residential neighborhoods with low to mid-rise built forms at medium densities, such as multiple unit residential developments, attached housing and apartments. And I'll just note that it does fall underneath the River Flats overlay, which is, is basically allows uh, administration during development approvals to provide uh, some guidance in terms of architectural design and various other things. So I'll finish off with just some uh, photos of the site. So that's the, the site in its entirety. We do, uh, as the city, we own the and acquired the parse, the house that's on the very far left of the, the yellow square. Uh, so that house is now uh, removed. So this is looking north towards the Medicine Hat Police Station and Remand Center. And it's the eastern part of the parcel. Looking northwest towards Maple Avenue. Looking southeast towards Ash Avenue and the residential neighborhood. Uh, this is looking across the site towards Maple Avenue. And then towards Ash Avenue. And then this is looking basically from the police station across uh, the street towards the south end of the site. So it is recommended through the Municipal Planning Commission that City Council approve bylaw 4808 to rezone the 800 block of 2nd Street Southeast which is plan 1491 block 12 lots six through 20 inclusive to medium density residential district. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. At this time, I would like to allow my fellow counselors an opportunity to ask questions. Yeah, Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, through the chair to manager Sisson. So uh, before us is a, is a request to change classification. Um, so with that, that's my question. Um, it's 
proposed to look at medium density. Um, and for me, I'd like to just understand the, ex the level of spectrum in terms of what could be built there. Um, and I think the, the highest density would be, in, your, in the words of the presentation, was a mid-rise built form. So under the uh, classification for medium density, what does that mean relative to floors? Uh, what would be the, 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 the highest density that that would look at relative to physical size as well? Like how many floors would that be, et cetera? So through the chair, the maximum building height within the medium density residential district uh, is three stories to a maximum of 12 meters for any attached housing or multi-unit residential development. So townhouses, that type of thing. And then five stories to a maximum of 20 meters for apartments. So a five store, five story apartment building could be built on this subject property without exception. So this is within medium density, correct? Through the chair, correct. So who would be the agent if there was an application that came forward and it's a five story is, and it's within, within policy? So that would be the development officer's authority just to approve it because it meets the criteria, correct? So through the chair, uh, it would be the, the development authority, um, which is administration that would typically review an application like this. Uh, so some of the land uses, depending on what was applied for, um, so attached housing, multiple unit residential development is permitted use. So as long as they conformed with the bylaw uh, and all other provisions within the land use bylaw, then that would be as of right, they could build that. Um, however, if they were proposing an apartment, it is discretionary use, then we would evaluate what the proposal looks like, any other features that they've, they've included as part of their application. And that's kind of, so through the chair, that, that's try, what I'm just trying to understand. So if a fairly intensive development gets placed there, um, like an apartment building, five stories high, what options are available? So it would go, the request would come in, it would have to be, go to MPC, who would, who would be the development officer to, or development body that would approve that? And I guess my question is, I'm, I'm reading the, the, the consideration that we're trying to uh, certainly in, create some intensification, but to what level is, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, a little bit of my concern. Um, and if it's a highest and best use, and I understand, I, and understand what medium density means, I just need to understand what's the ramifications if the highest density application comes in, who reviews it, and then what's the options if, if individuals within that neighborhood might object to that it's uh, too intense. So, so through the chair, uh, typically uh, a development permit application is re reviewed by administration as a development authority. In rare circumstances, we would refer it to the Municipal Planning Commission if we thought there was something that was out of context or if it was um, uh, a controversial land use, uh, we would typically refer that up to the Planning Commission. Um, in this particular case, uh, and I can give an example that we approved um, late last year, another apartment project, six stories just north of the site uh, along the river, and that was done through uh, administration. Any uh, opposition to that, you have 21 days from the date of approval to uh, lodge an appeal with the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board. Thank you, and, and again, I know we're just talking about a change in zoning, mm -hmm. but I think it's just, the, it's important for everyone to understand what the, what the ramifications of that is, so thank you. <coughs> Councillor Robbins. Yes, thank you, and through the chair, I actually had a question about your briefing note, and you touched on it a bit in your presentation, but I'm looking at specifically page five. I don't know if you've got it in front of you or... Sorry, just one sec, I don't no, have that. Of course. <laughs> you were trying to be concise in the presentation, but I just had a question. Uh, 
So what I want to ask about manager systems is the River Flats area redevelopment plan. And there's some um, reference in the briefing note to that area plan that has an old town neighborhood which was intended for public services and residential uses. Um, and then the briefing note goes on to talk about an anchor building on 2nd Street and Maple Avenue. Can you just tell me what, you, what that's about? And then I'll have a second question, if it's all right with you, Madam Chair. Thank you. So this sentence, uh, the site is specifically intended for public service. For reference to the policy, which you've already mentioned, indicates the area at 2nd Street, Southeast, and Maple Avenue. Southeast is intended for an anchor building to continue the civic district as detailed in the downtown redevelopment plan. So I just want to know how those two plans work together and what the purpose of that anchor building might be. So, so through the chair, um, as, as previously mentioned, the River Flats area to redevelopment plan is a little bit older. So it was uh, drafted in 2011, I believe. Mm -hmm. And the, at that time, that was one of the sites under contention potentially for a redeveloped arena site. Um, so that's where that, that policy direction was looking at. That's my understanding. It was precedes my time in the city, but um, that obviously is long, long past, uh, and the decision was to, to go with another location for that. And that's the Second Street at Maple Avenue anchor building that we're talking about. So what is the downtown redevelopment plan, and how does it connect to the flats, sorry, river flats area redevelopment plan? So just like the River Flats Area Redevelopment Plan, so it's, it's a statutory neighborhood plan. And the, in a subsequent presentation, I'll talk briefly about the Riverside Area Redevelopment Plan, also the same uh, level of plan as a statutory plan. The downtown plan is a non-statutory plan that was developed even prior to the River Flats plan for two, 2009. And it does cover up to Maple Avenue. So the two plans overlap slightly? There is some overlap, okay. uh, not for this site, but the area of North Railway. Okay, <coughs> thank you, that helps me a lot. And yeah. then the, the second sentence here, the proposal for multifamily development is still supported by the ARP, that being the North Flats, or the River Flats, Correct. not North Flats, ARP. Okay. And is that the policy six that you were describing to us earlier? Yeah, there, there's within an area. Five and six. Yeah, through the chair. Within an area redevelopment plan, there's a lot of different policies so that there's general policies that would support, um, for example, um, redevelopment opportunities throughout the whole plan area, but then there's also sometimes specific sites that are, are mentioned for redevelopment uh, opportunities. So obviously in the River Flats ARP, there's some concepts. Uh, there's one of, of the, the former arena site that shows large buildings, and, and that's just a concept, and you can see in some of those concepts that there are um, areas like the, the parking lots that are redeveloped. So it, it is, from a policy perspective, has some support. And then where there is conflicts, we would look to the MDP. Can I just ask one more question? You also mentioned in your presentation earlier, which intrigued me a little bit, um, about if the development permit is, if it ends up in development and there's a development permit granted, that there might be some architectural or other um, information. Can you just give me an example of what that might look like? Yeah, so we would look, depending on what type of buildings proposed, uh, we would look to uh, look, so there within the ARP there are some guiding uh, statements about what quality design materials looks like. Um, so we would look to make sure that during that application that what, they're, what they were proposing reflects that. Um, existing buildings in the area, using higher quality materials. So for example, one of the requirements is um, for, for lower density developments that the front facade has to be, you know, stone, brick, hardy board, instead of vinyl siding as an example. Right, and that all of those are contained in sort of images and I, ideas mm -hmm. from River Flats itself within the, mm -hmm. route. okay. So I'll just, just want to make one final comment on an area redevelopment plan. It is, it's a guiding policy document. So any of the, any of the rules that we've t taken out of that and placed in the, the land use bylaw, that becomes the regulatory piece. So there is a special, um, uh, there's a special section at the end of the line use bylaw that does talk about specific uh, aspects related to the river flats and, and implementation of design guidelines. 
so the River Flats Area Redevelopment is more of like a vision board of Correct. what you could accomplish, and the land use bylaw says what you can, and we're reviewing. Okay, all right. Correct. Thank you very much for all those answers. Uh, Councillor Sharps. Thank you. Through the chair to uh, Manager Sissons, a quick question on the electricity there. So um, do we... I know you mentioned it earlier that there could be some issues. Do we have a maximum output that we're looking at right now for that area? So I guess my question is if we pass this bylaw or zoning and it comes back and a, a developer wants to put the five stories on there and we find that there's not enough electricity, then what happens? Does it come back to council to rezone it to something else so they can fit? I mean, what would happen? I guess I, I don't want to see a developer in a position where they have to come back to council to figure this out, or is that their only choice? So through the chair, with, with some of the constraints we're dealing with, with electrical capacity in, in this area and others, the city, what happens typically is based upon a proposal, we would run it through the electric uh, distribution group and they would run their model based on their proposal and that would determine if there's a, enough existing capacity at that particular site at that particular point in time. Okay. So it's, it is an evolving situation and okay. there is, you know, uh, if there's capacity today, doesn't mean there's going to be capacity tomorrow. And maybe there's not enough today, but a year or two from, the, from now, there is more capacity. It really depends on what's happening. So we can't preempt the chaos down the road. We kind of have to go and see what happens. So through the chair, there is some options for them to reduce the scale of the development. Okay. So, for example, the number of units, if it was reduced to a point, and we've, we've run into that situation where, you know, the ultimate maximum allowable underneath the land use bylaw is not feasible based on servicing capacity, then they would either have to scale back or look to, to make upgrades potentially to the infrastructure, and that would be done through a development agreement in the development permit process. Okay, thank you. One follow-up? Um, I can't remember what was there before the parking lot. Is there any reclamation that's required on that land? Is there, sorry. Reclamation you, that's required? There's going to be through the chair. So part of the development permit process, we would do an environmental uh, scan of the site. Okay, so it's not so done yet. Got it. Yeah, phase one first and then okay. a phase two. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, appreciate your presentation. I was going to ask a quick question about environment, but it sounds like that's part of the... The, the plan moving forward. So um, I don't have any other speakers on my list and we'll now turn to city clerk to ask for a notification report. Were there any submissions? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just uh, summarize the public notice of the subject bylaw was published in the Medicine Hat News on Saturday, March 16th, 2024. And again on Saturday, March 23rd, 2024, a notification letter regarding the proposed bylaw was mailed to 45 adjacent and abutting residents in the general vicinity on March the 6th. One written submission was received from Alberta Infrastructure and is included in the agenda package. Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk. At this point, we will open the public hearing up to those in the gallery. If there's anyone in the gallery who would like to speak to this bylaw, please come down to the podium State and spell your name and state whether you're speaking for or against the bylaw. For a second time, if there's anyone in the gallery who would like to speak to this bylaw, please come down to the podium, state and spell your name and state whether you're speaking for or against the bylaw. And for a third and final time, if there's anyone in the gallery who would like to speak to this bylaw, please come down to the podium, state and spell your name and state whether you're speaking for or against the bylaw. All right, you Thank can... Thank you. My name's uh, Alex McQuaig, A-L-E-X-M-C-C-U-A-I-G. Okay. And I'm speaking against. Uh, it, nothing to do with your presentation, Mr. Sissons. I thought it was great. And I think generally speaking, uh, the land use rezoning is consistent with everything. My issue is the city is currently being run in a way that I believe is irregular. And my fear is that this bylaw and subsequent bylaws uh, are vulnerable to both uh, legal challenges. And I think, generally speaking, some, I think there's some confidences of the public that have been broken. So 
my, for this bylaw and subsequent ones, until council can conduct itself in a regular fashion, I think you need to concentrate on constituting yourself in what can be construed as a regular municipal council. And I just don't see it. I don't think you're doing it. I think you're letting the people down. And I think you should give the opportunity for people to um, express themselves, to, I think you should listen to them. But I'll leave it at that. And, and thank you for your time, unless you have any questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. Go ahead. So you can start by uh, spelling your name and then stating whether you're for or against the bylaw. I'm Corinne, C-O-R-I-N-N-E, Corf, K-O-R-F. Um, I'm a little confused by this. I'm a property owner on the 200 or the 800 block of 2nd Street Southeast. So does that include my home in all of these regulations now too? Is this saying that you can come in and say we're gonna put up big buildings right next door? Like I have a garden, I put in flowers. People love to walk by the back alley and look at my garden. Like it just sounds like you're squeezing me out. Is that correct? Like to me, this was all about this lot that's more in front of um, where the curling rink would be, but they some, somehow included the whole block all the way to Allowance Avenue, which includes my place. So why are these things going on like you're trying to sneak something through? Again, mismanagement, prop, I don't know. I'm not a politician, but you guys are supposed to be working for the people, which means me and the people, yet it seems like you're going big business. We're not a corporation, we are a city of people. And somehow this has been incorporated and these policies are coming in, I don't know from where, but you're not representing the people. Like this is the first I've heard about some of this stuff. And why, where did these letters come out? Oh, it was in the newspaper? You know, I should have had something in my mailbox. But this is, this is, this is tricky and I know um, people they want, they buy a place and they want to build a home. Great area, within walking distance, grocery store, senior center, downtown. Excellent, you end up in a, on a scooter, you still got all those options. But you're, you're pushing us out. And um, I'm not a fan of 15 minute cities. People need to give their head a shake. Study that a little bit more. And um, I'm sorry if this is the way the city is going. I'm sorry for some of you guys. I think you guys are in situations that you're having a hard time backing out. And I don't know who's pulling your strings, but it doesn't seem right to me. And I'm just a, just a citizen. Thank you for hearing me. All right. Um, so, uh, thank you to the speakers. The public hearing is now closed at 7.08 p.m. Um, we are going to uh, move on to the recommendation before us. The recommendation is that council considers second and third reading of bylaw 4808 to amend the land use bylaw to plan 1491, block two, lots six to 20 inclusive as medium density residential district. Um, so. So, <clears throat> so I move that council gives second reading to bylaw 4808. I'll second. Okay. And we will vote on that. Oh, we have, uh, I apologize, um, Mayor Clark and Councillor Hirsch are on the list for speakers. So we will start with you, Mayor Clark, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering if we could um, give um, Mr. Sissons an opportunity to respond to the 800 block question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Manager Sissons, would you like to come up to address the question? So through the chair, I'm, I'm not sure what residence uh, the lady was referring to, but the, that lot has existed as a, a police parking lot for quite a few years. Um, and that's the, the only the 
particular parcel that we outlined in the presentation that we're rezoning. So I'm not sure how to address that. Thank you, Manager Sissons. Go ahead, pull up. Yes, thank you, through the chair. So um, can we pull the, it, would it be possible to pull the parcel up again, just so we can confirm that the specific parcel we're talking about is just that parking lot, and it doesn't extend beyond into where it already existing houses are. So you can, through, through the chair, you can see the area in light blue that's labeled as subject land, and then you can see it on the, the image on the left um, is entirely the police parking lot that we're talking about rezoning. Thank you, Manager Sissons. So just to anybody that is um, unsure, we're just looking at the red outline um, on the very first block there on the quarter. It starts with a little chunk of orange and then has a, a blue block with a red outline. And anybody in the vicinity should have had a notice um, pinned to their, their door, um, and that was how we communicated. Um, is We have uh, Councillor Hirsch up next. Thank you, uh, just through the chair, and now we're out of the uh, out of the formal process of this, but uh, I guess that's why my form of questioning uh, to the citizen that, that raised their concern, um, because I am a bit concerned that a, a five-story apartment building could in fact be built there um, with very little ramifications in terms of trying to um, look at it from, from council's point of view. Uh, it could be signed off by a development officer because it's within, or it sounds like it's on an exception, sorry, my correction. So I'm actually in support of the, the individual that um, raised her concerns because just as much as I know we're talking about intensification, which I don't, I don't mind, but to what degree, I guess, is my concern. Um, so I mean, to have, um, I think for sure, I mean, that's been an empty lot for a very long time. I don't mind the idea of, of, of uh, reinvigorating it with density that for all the reasons it was listed there for, for within downtown, et cetera, uh, the amenities. Um, but again, I, I'm just very concerned about the level of density that we're, we're chasing after. And again, if there's any issues that come up, what's the, what's the, uh, resolution on this uh, to, to the level of density that we can do. So I'm just, I am very concerned about it. Um, that said, um, this is a zoning change, not the application itself. Um, so I await a development permit. Uh, I, am, I am in support of the medium density, but again, I am worried about if the development per permit comes, request comes in from a five story point of view, I will be uh, quite concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hirsch. Councillor Dumanowski. Thank you, uh, through the chair. Thank you to uh, Manager Sissons for the presentation. I, like the others have spoken, I, um, we're excited by the prospect of development or redevelopment in Phil. Um, at the same time, um, mindful that we are, we are here to, um, to be spokespeople for for the people who live in the res in the area, immediate area in, in particular, um, I I am uh, I was raised and grew up on the River Flats, proudly so. I have family and friends who who live there and reside there, so I'm very much in tune with with that and appreciate the concerns that you raised. Um, I'm I was going to ask uh, before the mayor did uh, if Mr. Sissons could clarify, but to to my knowledge, and I think it's been clarified um, adequately that that um, it would be just the parking lot itself that would be rezoned. Um, I recognize um, and echo to a large extent Councillor Hirsch's comments around um, the, the desire or need to rezone, but at the same time um, be mindful of what could be developed there under that classification. Uh, we are, we are, um, we hear from residents in other parts of the city in, in similar veins when it comes to development. I'm, I'm encouraged though that, that there would be opportunities, it seems to me, uh, if I heard it correctly, opportunities for 
uh, council at, of the day, whenever, whoever that might be, to have the opportunity to hear uh, or have some say on on um, a proposal. We are only at a zoning change now, and it's it's easy to get uh, locked in to the mindset of what might be there versus what will be there. But but um, when I reflect on the um, River Flats redevelopment plan um, that took five years to put together, and again, I know it's a um, guiding document, as has been uh, indicated, but it's it's a, a a product of passion and people who who put a lot of effort energy even though it, it was some years ago uh, i think it, it it's just as relevant today as it ever were um being that it's a guiding document ultimately there it, it's there's some discretion there my only parting comment outside of recognizing the concerns that were brought up is uh that i i hope that the whatever at some point the development that goes there that even though it's it's a guiding document that the ARP actually be um, held to the letter of the law because um, other developments, uh, single family and others down there um, over the years since the ARP was put in place have, have been required to um, submit to those same, um, I call them stringent, but important guiding documents to, as is indicated in the briefing note to ensure the integrity of the of the space to make sure that it adheres to the diversity of, of a redevelopment um, in an older area it has it, it creates a sense of space etc um, my I don't want to see us I'll, in plain language see us hurriedly um, move a project forward at the expense of not recognizing the ARP because it will it will quite frankly uh, challenge those who have invested in the past and those in the future who will look to that development and um, want to see it adherence so that they too can have the confidence um, as they redevelop or create infill. So that was my main concern. Um, and uh, I am prepared to support it. Um, I think the the concerns raised today are, are being acknowledged or are in the books, if you will, and ultimately this does give us some opportunity on land that is currently within the holdings of the city, being used as a parking lot to be become a wonderful addition of some form of residence for a, a wonderful community um, and a, a wonderful city. So I, I, I will support this today. Thank you, Councillor Dumanowski. Councillor Sharps? Thank you, and through the chair, I actually have three questions. Uh, my first one is to the citizen. Uh, I want to make sure that the citizen has spoke, and you now see this picture. Do you feel like this answers your question? Yeah, absolutely. Well, maybe not, because it, it doesn't get out recorded then, if you don't mind. If you wouldn't mind coming, sorry. Thank you. Okay, so the picture says one thing, but then he included up to, is Thank that you. better? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, the picture said one thing, but then the documents or whatever I said, I saw where it said from Maple Avenue to Division Avenue. Okay. Um, that goes my whole block. Okay, I'm just going to get you to hang tight. And please don't go anywhere. Manager Sissons, would you mind just walking us through that? Because I, I, that does concern me. It's not the first time we've heard in planning uh, situations that there's been some miscommunication. So if we could get it sorted, that would be ideal right now. So through the chair, the area on the map is the area that's been rezoned. I think what this resident was referring to was the policy direction of the entire area okay. is moving towards more density in and around the arena lands, North Railway area, that area. Does that make you, so this is the only land that they're referring to in this particular bylaw? That is correct. Just what's highlighted in red. Do you, do you feel like your question has been answered? So through the chair, for further clarity, if you actually look on the, the map, the actual uh, property title listing, so plan 1491, block 12, lots 6 through 20, if you're, if you're wanting a, a very specific legal description of the land that's okay. being rezoned. Okay. 
Um, and then I was just wondering if, as a takeaway, uh, maybe if we could just follow up with the city clerk, because again, it wasn't the first time I've heard that somebody hasn't received it. So maybe we could just look at if the if it was uh, sent to all those correct addresses. You know, it doesn't hurt to check in my mind to make sure that we are doing it. Uh, so that was my first question. So something that I brought back up in the past, and I do have some concerns with this, because I know we keep talking about a housing crisis, but I keep asking the question, where's the crisis? Is it one-bedroom apartments? Is it one-bedroom homes? Is it condos? Is it townhomes? Is it three bedrooms? Is it, and I can't get an answer. Even if you go to the Canadian Housing Authority, they're not giving us an answer. So my fear is, and it is a fear that we throw up five-story buildings. Um, and if this was to get approved, to manager assistants, you can correct me again. Let's say we got we approved it here, and five stories goes on. There is no way other than SDAB to appeal that, correct? It's not going to come back to municipal planning or council for another thumbs up, correct? So through the chair, um, once council has made their decision on the rezoning, any future applications on the site, would be referred to and go through the regular development process, which is of the development authority. So which it's administration. administration. Yeah. In some circumstances, MPC would, might be involved. The only time a development permit goes through to council if it's, if, if it's direct control lands. Right. And um, is it normal for MPC to usually get zoning changes or what would be the other way this would come in front of Councillor McGrogan and myself currently? So the, the rezoning goes through planning commission yeah. first, and then it makes its way through to council. But if we approve this, it'll never see the, us again if somebody throws five stories up. Is that right? Okay. That, I'm just trying to make sure I understand very clearly what this does. Mm -hmm. City Manager Mitchell. Thank you, through the chair. I understand your concern and Councillor Hirsch's concern and they're valid. But one thing we are very mindful is what the community needs and what the community wants. So our planning oh. department, I'm sorry, I'm speaking. Please be respectful if you can. So one of the things that we have to understand is that the manager and the planners in the planning department will review and understand what the neighborhood, the vibrancy of the neighborhood, et cetera. And if, as Robert Sissons had said, there is something that may be too high, too controversial. They will make sure it goes through the planning commission and that's what the planning commission's there for, to vet these types of things. Thank you. Thank you, city manager. And ultimately, if there is a concern on behalf of a community, they can do an appeal that that process is available to them at a certain point. I'll Obviously, we don't want to make a decision that we feel is going to result in, a in an appeal, but I am going to, yeah, go ahead. So I'll, I'll just clarify um, through the chair that appeals are available um, if it's a discretionary use, if it's a permitted use that has a variance, or if there was a matter of process that was not followed properly. That's it. So if it is a permitted use and, and they conform to the bylaw, so if it's, if they propose some townhouses, as an example, they conform to the bylaw, there's no right of appeal unless it's on process. Okay. So I, I'm just going to speak last here. I don't have anybody else on my speakers list. Um, oh, do you have one more thing that you want to... Oh, yeah, go ahead, Councillor Robbins. Sorry, and through the chair, I, didn't, I thought I should chime in since others um, had. This is... Um, my, my neighborhood actually, I'm a happy resident of the River Flats. And when I was um, looking through the open council, my um, children noticed the maps and they wanted to look at the map people um, and they wanted to know what I was looking at. And so we were just talking about um, changing things. And so a lot of my conversation with you about the River Flats redevelopment plan was really to understand what the vision was for the flats. and. So my children had an opinion. I said, well, that's great. We're residents of the flats, but I don't represent only the flats. We don't, you know, I have to represent the whole city and what will it matter um, out, to people outside of the flats what this neighborhood might look like. But I think that it matters tremendously to the people who live in the flats, what their neighborhood um, looks like, speaking as one. Um, so I, I'm concerned about two things. One, uh, which Councillor Hirsch and others have already identified, that 
if we agree to rezone to medium density residential, um, council really doesn't have any um, further input into what development looks like as long as it complies with what the bylaw is, and I understand that. And I'm also worried about the electrical sort of limitation. So if we're stating as council, as our message to the community, this land is um, available for development and available for large development um, for that area, I mean, not large development in bigger cities, but large development for the flats, I'm not sure that we're in a position to follow through with that. So. Um, I'm not going to support the, not because I don't want more people living in the flats, I want lots of people living in the flats for sure. It's a great neighborhood as pointed out and has so many wonderful amenities and great people and lovely gardens that I like to walk past as well. But I'm just a little bit concerned that with the electrical issue um, and what the vision was originally for the flats in that 2011 uh, River Flats uh, development plan that it's not quite working for me um, with what's being proposed or what could be proposed. So I'm not going to support the, the rezoning, although I certainly appreciate all of the thought behind it. All right, we have Councillor McGrogan. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to make a couple comments. Uh, one is I'm, I'm noticing that basically this being zoned medium density residential, uh, there's a lot in the neighborhood already behind, uh, um, I guess, the next block down, which would be the 800A block. There's a whole row of it. And I, just from what my memory serves me of those places, they're mostly single family dwelling with a mixture of maybe, a, you know, some duplexes or whatever. So this will be zoned similarly to, I guess, all the other, I guess the question, I just want to make sure I've got it right. It'll be, it'll be zoned medium density, similar to the spots that are marked in that same color. Is that right? So through the chair, uh, there are various areas in the in the river flats that are already zoned as medium density. So going east of the, the ballpark, there's two apartment buildings. And then directly east of that, there's a new one that's going up. Thank you. So I guess my comment is, uh, you know, we're living it right now in another area of Medicine Hat where, you know, we've got an area zoned similarly and people are... I guess upset about what could be developed in their area and that could happen here we could end up with four but we could end up with a townhouse development we said we could end up with duplexes correct I mean is there there's a number of things that could be considered in this area after a developer makes their decision correct so through the, the chair it could be everything from a series of fourplexes to row housing to stock townhouses to apartments correct Okay, thank you. Councillor Hirsch? Well, and just through clarification again, we talk about medium density, and, and I, I'm quite comfortable. It already was, it was expressed that it's, it's uh, throughout the neighbourhood. And again, just to, just to be clear, because I think Councillor Sharp had kind of talked about it in terms of any, any options here, if a five-storey is proposed, it's a discretionary request is that correct under the medium medium so through the chair that's correct so if it's discretionary there is an, a, a, a chance to appeal if individuals would feel that the that the subject application on an, in a discretionary manner not not the normal as opposed to the uh, allowable um, um, development that they have the option of raising a concern or a, an appeal so um, again I don't want to stop in terms of the classification of the change because it was already mentioned that there's been medium density. Um, I think uh, the fact is if it, if it is true, if the application, development application comes forward that makes uh, sense relative to the neighborhood and it becomes a five-story discretion, then we've got an option in terms of a, some, some level of appeal. So uh, I, again, I'm comfortable uh, supporting this, but again, with the understanding that anything uh, in, a, in a larger density, like a five-story, is discretionary and could be appealed. So, thank you. I'll just make a uh, final comments. And I'm not missing anyone, I don't think. Um, so, I I follow several different um, 
pages online for people looking for housing, um, including like one people looking for one one bedroom, many small uh, small families looking for home rentals because they can't afford a mortgage at this time. And I I, I see it every day. There's people looking for homes and housing and affordable housing, and um, multifamily units are often popular a popular solution to those who I see post. So in my perspective, this is uh, this is solving a problem. This is providing housing that we desperately need, um, especially multifamily housing is often more affordable than uh, buying a single detached house. And uh, in that case, I think this is an important step forward. I do respect and understand the, the concern about um, Multi multi rise uh, buildings. However, in my mind, I go to uh, one of my favorite spaces is Kensington in Calgary, and Kensington does a great job of. And I don't know exactly what the builder or what a developer would propose for this site, but I think having storefronts with a few uh, apartments above creates a, a vibrancy in a space that I really enjoy. And I'm, I know if you see there's lots of hustle and bustle in those neighborhoods and other communities. So I appreciate that. I appreciate the potential for more of that in our community. Now, I also respect that big changes are hard. And especially when you're used to a neighborhood that is familiar, that is single detached homes, you don't want the the consistency of that space to change drastically. So I, I have confidence that your staff will work collaboratively with a developer and, and come to a solution for this space that is the best case scenario in your perspective and know that um, we have an empowered population that will come forward if they're unhappy with that as long as it um, is one of those considered areas. So uh, thank you for bringing this forward, uh, Manager Sissons. Much appreciate it. All right, as my computer went to sleep. Okay, so um, with no further speakers, we will vote on second reading. Okay, that is uh, a pass. Um, do I have a motion for third reading? Yes, I move the council give third and final reading to bylaw 4808, a bylaw of the City of Medicine Hat to amend the land use bylaw plan 1491, block two, lot six to 20, inclusive as medium density residential district. I'll second. Are there any further comments or discussion? Okay, we will vote. And again, that passes. Um, item 9.2, our second item under this section is bylaw 4809 to amend the land use bylaw to rezone 830A Balmoral Street Southeast as neighborhood commercial district. I call this public hearing to order at 7.33 p.m. We have Robert Sissons back at it again with uh, manager of planning here to give us an introduction to this item. Go ahead. So thank you and I'll try and keep everything as brief as possible because there's a third one as well. So um, so this presentation is for bylaw 4809, uh, land use bylaw application uh, to rezone 830A Balmoral Street Southeast to medium to uh, neighborhood commercial district. So again, a brief overview of the presentation. Uh, so this site is located within the central portion of the River Flats neighborhood. So the surrounding area is predominantly low density and medium density residential on the west side of Allowance Avenue with low density residential and neighborhood commercial to the east. The site was historically zoned as community services uh, to accommodate uh, a school site there through various different iterations of, of over, over the years. Um, the school site is now vacant, uh, which does allow for the redevelopment of the site. So it is privately owned at this point. So the site is walkable to multiple amenities in the area, including commercial areas along Maple Avenue, 
North Railway Street and public parks such as, as Rotary Park and Strathcona Island. It abuts Allowance Avenue, which is a collector road and is in close proximity to Maple Avenue, again an arterial road. And the site is primarily accessed from Allowance Avenue. Um, it has, has access from Balmoral uh, and does also have lane access as well. So there's a transit drop uh, directly across the street on Allowance Avenue uh, and another one further south. And there's several along Maple Avenue as well. So the line use amendment is for the rezoning of the subject site from medium density residential district to neighborhood commercial district. So I'll just note this one may look familiar to some people uh, as it was rezoned in uh, on April 4th of 2023. Uh, at that time it was zoned community service and it was rezoned to medium density residential based on the, the application of the, of the developer. So the intent of this rezoning is to accommodate a proposed change uh, of use to a, lease a portion of the existing building and the field for a, a daycare operator. Um, and then the, the balance of the site would remain uh, potentially for residential. But essentially under the, the neighborhood commercial district, there are various uses that are allowed. Uh, this rezoning will allow for the existing and existing building and site to be used and to bring a necessary service potentially to the neighborhood while still allowing for potential residential infill in the future. So again, this site is very similar to the last one in that it, uh, we're trying to remove barriers for a developer in this case, and we're trying to maximize uh, the existing uh, space that we have within our established neighborhoods. Uh, this adaptive reuse of the existing building on the site would increase the city's tax base without installation of new infrastructure uh, and therefore is the most effective form of densification. So again, the uh, MDP does talk about the sectors uh, of, of the community and then within that, what each one is classified as a typology. So this one is the general urban typology, which is more uh, suited for lower mature, lower density areas that are largely residential. There's also various housing types, parks, schools, churches, uh, smaller commercial, and uh, they're typically grid pattern streets and rear lanes. So the map shows the city center sector and the location of the subject site is the star on the map. So in terms of policy, the, I've gone through several of these previously, but uh, it does specify that medium and density, medium density or high density could be located on the perimeter of a neighborhood along a major street. So in this particular case, it is along the perimeter, but uh, allowance is a fairly major collector roadway. Uh, policy five does outline that neighborhoods should include a variety of housing types and designs that support those shifting demographics and family structures all ages and abilities, and a variety of income levels and ownership structures. Uh, our energized infill section talks about a balanced approach to accommodating a, a portion of our population growth through infill development, and then again, concentrating them in particular locations. Um, with this one, though, we'll highlight two policies that are relevant. So. Um, one is the to ensure orderly and financially efficient long-term growth by effectively planning development. And policy nine talks about the interim use of underlying school buildings or sites for community purposes is encouraged. Uh, priority four encourages minor increases in density through infill development in established neighborhoods to optimize use of existing land and services. Um, so guiding policy four talks about underutilized neighborhood commercial or institutional sites should be creatively repurposed, including redevelopment as more mixed, more dense mixed use buildings. And then to the river flats neighborhood plan again. Um, so it, again, this one is within that plan boundary. The site, uh, is situated in which is referred to as the Old Town neighborhood, which is intended to be for public services and residential uses. The site is specifically intended for um, 
public service site at, in the map, but it was also a formal school site at that time. Um, and it is adjacent to sites that the plan identifies as primarily single dwelling, mixed use, and neighborhood commercial land uses. The proposal is still supported by the ARP as it aligns with one of the major principles of the ARP as well as several policies that we will go through. So again, in this particular case, things have changed over time. The, the plans um, coming up on 13 years old now at this point. So what was drafted at that point in time is now slightly changed. Uh, section 2.2 of the ARP does indicate that redevelopment and growth that enhances the community's diversity and amenities is encouraged. So intensifying by integrating new and, and diverse residential housing types and encourage sensitively designed commercial uh, uses. 3.2 talks about ensuring that essential community amenities such as schools, churches, daycare, and retail are protected and enhanced. And 3.22, policy three, schools, parks, and community amenities, including but not limited to churches, daycares, and community centers should be maintained and enhanced through the, throughout the primarily single dwelling area to meet the social and active and passive recreational needs of residents and contribute to the overall neighborhood environment. So the intent of the public service area is to provide for the development of civic uses and schools that serve uh, to be a focus of the community for education, recreation, and other community activities. So policy five does say that ensure the development supports the sense of place for the neighborhood by providing sensitive integration of land uses and high quality intensification. Support policy six, support comprehensive multi-dwelling residential and community amenity developments. Um, and this again goes back to that one point along 2nd Street Southeast between Maple Avenue and South Allowance Avenue. But the, the last part of it is more relevant in this case and within local neighborhood commercial nodes, which is what this little area is. The rezoning is supported by policies uh, outlined in the ARP and any new developments should align with the policies outlined in the area redevelopment plan and Appendix A of the ARP, um, the residential infill design guidelines. So finally, the regulatory context. Uh, so the purpose of neighbor commercial districts is to maintain and promote small scale commercial development that serves the needs of the immediate neighborhood while encouraging incorporation of residential uses above commercial uses in multi-story buildings. Uh, medium density residential does not allow for any daycare facilities as permitted or discretionary uses, whereas the neighborhood commercial district allows for both daycare facilities and apartments as discretionary uses. So the proposal to rezone the site to neighborhood commercial is to accommodate a proposed change of use to a daycare facility and then the potential redevelopment of the balance of the building. And I will just note that this site does fall under Schedule A of the River Flats overlay which does have, again, some uh, is ex existing regulatory requirements in terms of design. So this is the particular the site uh, that's been rezoned. So it's the entire site of the former school site. It's the view from the northeast corner of the site, the southwest portion of the site. Uh, and then the front of the building from Balmoral Street. This is the older portion of the building located on the eastern side of the site. And then just, uh, this is the far eastern portion looking north along Allowance Avenue. So it is recommended through the Municipal Planning Commission that City Council approve bylaw 4809 to rezone 830A Balmoral Street Southeast to neighbor commercial district. Thanks. Thank you, Manager Sissons. Um, does anyone have questions for uh, Manager Sissons? Councillor McGrogan. Thank you. Um, I think of the last hearing, that, or the last uh, bylaw that we just passed, we, we, we zoned that medium density. Uh, so if all things being equal, in this particular case, we went through the same exercise, you know, not too long ago to, to zone this medium density. I understand why we're changing it. I'm wondering, uh, and I think, you know, this came up in planning in our Municipal Planning Commission meeting as well. What would stop if the, you know, if the uh, 
if the all of the plans allow it, that we wouldn't just trigger this zoning almost immediately in places like the last one. Like, what is the what what would be the disadvantage of that if our you know area structure plans and neighborhood plans would allow you know like the previous zoning just if we went straight to this we wouldn't be having the second meeting right now so i'm just curious uh why we choose one versus another so through the chair within so zoning is a regulatory tool you can include districts that are very broad and include a whole range of district or of land uses from single family all the way up to apartments. You can include commercial uses, you can include public land uses, but it provides very little certainty of what's happening. So in terms of why do we have certain zones is to, and to demonstrate and, and to provide a framework for uh, administration to review proposals. So basically council is saying in this particular location, we, except that the following land uses are appropriate. So the more, the more broad you make it, yes, it's more flexible. Yes, you would have less rezonings, but you would also have less certainty about what happens at a particular site. Thank you. Any other questions around the table? Councillor Hirsch? Just to point out again on this briefing note, it indicates that neighborhood commu commercial district allows for daycare facilities and apartments as discretionary uses, again, that could be appealed if need be. So um, I think it's just important to highlight that. Thank you. Okay, I have one question. Um, being that this space currently is in the shape of a school, <laughs> although it's not a school, um, and it has a decent amount of green space, how might that change with a new build and would there still be green space preserved in this particular location with the rezoning? So through the chair, uh, so we're dealing primarily with the rezoning at the moment. It would really depend on what the developer had planned for the site. So they would bring a proposal forward. Does it meet with our regulations that council set out through the land use bylaw? We would review it against that. There's no regulation in the neighbor commercial district that says you have to have a field space or a playground space. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, City Clerk, do you have a notification report and were there any submissions? Thank you, Madam Chair. So public notice of this subject, bylaw 4809, was published in the Medicine Hat News on Saturday, March 16th and Saturday, March 23rd, 2024. A notification letter related to the proposed bylaw was mailed to 85 adjacent abutting or other property owners within the vicinity on March 6, 2024, and no written submissions were received. Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk. And, and just to clarify, the, the notice also is on our city website as well. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So through the chair, the notice is posted on the city website uh, once we have an application. And also note that with as per council direction from last year, we do post on every rezoning, we post a, a portable sign for a minimum of two weeks advising uh, of what's happening, how to uh, learn more information about it, submit comments. Well, with rezoning, comments come directly through a public hearing. If it's a development permit application, it would go through a, a comment portal. Thank you. I've seen, I've started to see them pop up and they are informative and easy to view. So thank you for that revision. That's awesome. Okay. So at this point where we will open the public hearing up to the gallery is if there's anyone in the gallery who would like to speak to this bylaw, please come down to the podium, state and spell your name and state whether you're speaking for or against the bylaw. Hello, you can start by stating Hi. and spelling your name and whether you're speaking for or against the bylaw. Kristen Mann, K-R-I-S-T-E-N-M-A-N-N. -N -N. Uh, mostly I have a bunch of questions about the bylaw, so I'm not sure if I'm for or against. Um, generally, I'm in uh, support of redevelopment and revitalization of the flats. I've been a longtime resident. I've lived directly across the street from where this is being proposed uh, and, and still in the neighborhood. What I'd really like is to see the map from the presentation again, because I was confused. A number of 
locations were zoned commercial, but with the exception of Starlight, I believe all, everything else is residential or so being operated as residential. It looks like Rondi's working on pulling it up for us, so we'll just hang tough for a second. Okay, so we're looking at the let's central, yeah, it looks, it's polygonal with one. And according to the sign. legend, everything that is pink is neighborhood commercial zoned. But with the exception of that small half lot, right directly across Allowance Avenue from the proposed lands, everything else is residential. So I'm not sure why they are currently zoned commercial, and I would not consider that a neighborhood commercial district. Um, the largest... Oh, we lost our map. Yeah, we did. Um, what would be directly across the street, Allowance Avenue, but the larger por portion is just a vacant lot. Um, and then the, all of those other three are houses. Five, six, are all houses. So I might recommend, if you do have questions specific to the map, that we re we um, record them, being that we because we need this to be kind of like the making your statement. So we can absolutely answer this. We can do it right now. Or if you have a, a list, like you said, you have a list of questions, yeah. it might be better for us to record them and then we could document them and email them to you. So my first question would be, why are we considering this a neighborhood commercial area when there's only one commercial business currently? If we rezone the subject lands, does there any discretion in what goes into it? I mean, currently I heard that there will be a daycare there, but there, if it's zoned commercial, it could be anything. Um, and is there any going to be any parking accommodation, any uh, land use constraints upon that. I mean, currently we have the mustard seed in blue there and it's created some issues for the neighborhood. Um, will that affect the, the local businesses? I mean, there's only one. Um, and then, yeah, are, are they gonna make parking accommodations if it does become something more substantially commercial? And will they leave the current building standing or portions of it, or will it be completely a new rebuild? Good questions. Um, Manager Sissons, I understand that because this is just rezoning, we don't necessarily know the answers to some of those questions, but maybe you might be able to speak to some of them, including how um, the commercial, like I know that the, it's been mentioned that this is commercial, so does that mean anything's possible? But I understand that there are limitations to what we're going to see in this space. So would you like to speak to that? So through the chair, are, is the resident completed her statement? I will double check. It sounds like she's done with her questions. Uh, Kristen, are you finished with your questions? Okay, so is this, you're okay with us answering them now? Okay, go ahead. So, sorry, in terms of the, um, that site, when it is rezoned, um, there's a multitude of regulations within the land use bylaw, and one of them does talk about parking regulations. So on every development permit, we review what the land use is, what's acceptable from a parking perspective, dimensions of parking stalls, how you access them. There's, there's a whole, multiple pages that cover off parking. Um, as well as other every other type of regulation you can think of. Uh, in terms of why some of those sites are zoned commercial, some of them are at a request. Uh, so the city went through it, the last major citywide rezoning in 2013 when this current land use bylaw was adopted. A lot of the, the zoning at that time was zoned a certain way uh, based on the, the concepts of the River Flats area redevelopment plan. We, are, we do have a, a current zoning bylaw project underway right now where we will probably, um, so just to go into a little bit more detail, but we will look to add a lot of additional districts so that going back to a previous question about flexibility versus certainty, mm -hmm. this is gonna provide council and the public with more certainty as there's gonna be more tiers of zoning, so more zoning requests, but more certainty. Uh, and one of the other things we're looking at doing is making sure that there's no legal non-conforming situations. So um, when you have a property, so some of those are commercial, 
Um, and so neighborhood commercial zoning would be the appropriate use. Some of them are houses, um, and we would look to likely zone them something different at that time, unless the resident of that particular property wanted them that way. Thank you for your answers. And those, those tiered um, solutions were posed at the open house on that big, I think that on that big um, banner. Is that what we're heading towards? Yeah, so through the chair, it was at the open house, the spring trade show, various other uh, events, and you can access them online as well currently. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McNally, would you like to come forward? Uh, hi there, my name is Joel McNally. Um, sorry, I spell my name? Yes, please. J O E L M C capital N A L L Y. Thank uh, you. I'm in favor of the development for you know reasons. Uh, the only reason I'm up here is to just kind of pass along that um, uh, with the uh, daycare provider we're dealing with, um, and we're, we're currently waiting for the province to provide approval or not on, on the subsidy that they need to operate. Um, with that daycare provider we're dealing with, their uh, intent is to take the entire balance of the uh, lot as a green space. So that would be pretty much it for the site development um, at that time. Uh, However, we don't have total control over whether or not that actually happens because it's a provincial matter. Uh, anyway, uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to say because you guys got a lot to do. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for your comments and for um, informing us about the green space. That's helpful. Um, all right. Uh, so for a second time, if there is anyone in the gallery who would like to speak to this bylaw, please come down to the podium, state and spell your name, and state whether you're speaking for or against the bylaw. Okay. And for a third and final time, if there's anyone in the gallery who would like to speak to this bylaw, please come down to the podium, state and spell your name, and state whether you're speaking for or against the bylaw. Okay, thank you to those of you that came up. Um, and the public hearing is now closed at 757. Uh, we have a recommendation before us and I'm looking for a motion for second reading on that particular recommendation. And we will- I move that council gives second reading to bylaw 4809. Second. second. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Second. McGrogan and then Sharps. Okay. Um, and then we are going to open the floor to discussion. Councillor Robbins. Yes, thank you, and through the chair, I, I was um, also, again, as this is my neighborhood, edging closer to my home for sure, um, curious about those pink, <laughs> I mean, I walk past there all the time, and there's definitely homes, not commercial. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that the idea of that as a commercial zone, I was concerned about it, but now that I've heard manager assistants say that the property owners would have some say in that if there's a rezoning or if they wish to request a rezoning or maybe back in 2013 they wanted to leave it as it was, that does reassure me that there's gonna be further input by property owners if anything changes there. Um, I'm in support of this. Uh, we already dealt with this back in April um, and the idea of adding a daycare to um, to this area really appeals to me as well. Not that my children are gonna go to it, they're way too old for that, but I think there's a lot of families who could benefit. Um, so I'm supportive of the idea. Thank you, Councillor Robbins. Councillor Dumanowski. Yeah, through the chair, I, um, <laughs> you sat through my my talk last time. This, this is my old uh, stomping grounds. I literally could throw a rock from that spot to my old house, um, proudly again, uh, grew up in the River Flats, um, that was my old school. Uh, so when I think about the character of what is there and what could be there, uh, I'm pleased to hear Mr. McNally uh, speak to the desire to develop uh, a daycare, which we all know is essential and critical um, to, to many uh, homes uh, and families, uh, and not only in that area, but across the city. So I, I hope that proposal goes through. My, my big thing and, and our, my caution is always, and what I've been cautioned over the years is not to envisage a certain type of um, development because that in the future, it may not be so. Um, so my, my thought would be if, if the daycare didn't go ahead, what next, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I'm a little bit, less enthusiastic 
um, about the zoning change only because um, of what could happen in, not that, that the old historical building, uh, although it's not recognized as such, would be demolished and the, you know, quite frankly, a, a large apartment building could be developed there, uh, but that it would it be, would it fit the character of a very, very much a small, very dense historic residential area. Uh, Councilor Robbins, you're correct, all those, um, other than Starlight Convenience Store, it, they're all residents, so um, they're identified as potential commercial, but they all currently function as a residence other than a parking lot, um, or an empty lot, pardon me. So, but what, what gives me good favor, and, and I will support, is the reputation of um, the McNally uh, family, and I'm gonna say that, um, not to give them accolade openly, but they've done some great innovative, creative, responsible developments and redevelopments across the city over the years. And I, I've yet to object to any of them uh, because they've been done with respect and regard to the to the uh, area. So I, I will hold true to that value and belief uh, that you will do it uh, similarly here. So I will be in support. Councillor Hyder. Thank you, and through the chair, um, I am in support of this rezoning, and Councillor Dumanowski took my thunder. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge um, developers in our community and the McNally family and Cambridge Investments um, have had a long-standing involvement in our community and done wonderful work. So thank you, Joel, for coming up and, and expressing your, um, your thoughts on things, and we look forward to the future. Thank you, Councillor Hyder. Um, I will just make my comments. I don't see anybody else on our list. So uh, again, I'm thinking about how can this possibly meet the needs of the community, uh, op making this a, uh, a more flexible district un understandably is going to open up possibility and that will allow the, the current posed uh, development to be possible and I think not only housing is critical in our community, but also care for children. And I think that uh, any sort of alignment to that is essential. I, I can't imagine not wanting to move forward for that particular reason. Of course, understanding that we are just on step one. So um, I will be supporting this. And at this point in time, we will vote. That is unanimous. All right, do I have a motion I, for third reading? I move that council gives third and final reading to bylaw 4809, a bylaw of the city of Medicine Hat to amend the land use bylaw to rezone 830A Balmoral Street Southeast as neighborhood commercial district. Second. Thank you. Do we have any further discussion or final comments? Okay, seeing none, we will vote. And that is unanimous. Our third and final public hearing is bylaw 4810 to amend the land use bylaw to rezone plan 3204M block three lot 37 to medium density residential district. I call this public he hearing to order at 8.03 PM. We have Robert Sissons, manager of planning here for a third and final time to give us an introduction to this item. Thank you, manager Sissons, go ahead. Thank you. So this is a presentation for bylaw 4810, uh, which is a line use bylaw amendment to rezone to medium density residential district. So again, an overview. So this site is located within the eastern portion of Riverside. The surrounding area consists primarily of medium density residential land uses as shown on the orange on the map and includes smaller scale residential as well as apartments. Um, there's also some single detached homes within the low density residential district shown in the yellow on the map. To the northwest is a community service parcel containing a church and the site is also located near the Canadian Pacific Railway um, with close access to the river. The immediate area, surrounding area is fully developed with some sites uh, presenting opportunities for redevelopment though. 
So the uh, land use bylaw amendment is for the rezoning of the subject site, uh, which right now currently does not have any land use designation, and it's going to be rezoned to medium density residential district. So the subject parcel currently shares a certificate of title with a small strip of land directly to the south, and there's a subdivision application being reviewed by the city to subdivide the parcels to create their own separate certificate of title to allow the land to be sold separately. Uh, a condition of the subdivision approval will be the rezoning of the site to medium density residential district. Uh, so the intent of the rezoning is to accommodate a land sale and parcel consolidation with the adjacent block of land uh, to the east for future redevelopment. The subject site is required to be designated with a land use district to be developed in the future. The land is currently vacant and is a remaining remnant piece of land from back when the days when 2nd Avenue and Finley Bridge would have been the previous iteration of the Trans-Canada Highway. So within road right-of-ways, we don't typically zone, get assigned a zoning, and that's where this uh, small parcel came from. There's, it's just existed over the years as a small area beside the, the edge of the bridge, if you will. Uh, so the potential land sale uh, element for the subject site was circulated to the technical coordinating committee for review and comments and there were no major concerns with selling the land any technical concerns um, as far as development would be addressed through a future development permit process uh, so I'll just reiterate that these both all three of these uh, address these two main strategic priorities in council's plan um, by consolidating a smaller parcel of land with the larger parcel, it means that the combined parcel has direct frontage onto a public roadway on the west side, which is the whole intent of this, which eliminates the requirements for a, uh, like a, a larger building to have a setback. Um, so under the building code, if you abut a roadway, it's not as strict as if you abut another parcel. So that's the reason for this. Um, and that, what that does is it increases the development potential of the adjacent consolidated lot. So just a little bit of financial impact on this one. So this slide represents uh, data from the Riverside area and what uh, medium density residential use could have on the site. Uh, so the value per hectare is determined obviously by taking the assessed value of a site and then dividing it by the site area. So the first two rows are sites within Riverside. Uh, containing apartment buildings and the third row shows the value per hectare of a single detached home uh, as a comparison and then the fourth row shows the value per hectare of the subject site as it is today. So the highest value per hectare is clearly shown as that medium density residential land use and note that these are all estimates uh, except for the so the estimated value is is an estimate obviously, but the, the values shown there are pulled from actual sites. Again, this is uh, just an overview of the MDP. Um, this particular site is a uh, general urban site, but it does have a flag in one of the maps as a minor intensification site. So similar to previous application, the MDP policy identifies specific locations for high density residential along major streets. Also, it does talk about this in the MDP in terms of an intensification map. Um, and also increasing the variety of housing types is a policy that supports this application. Uh, again, the that priority three talks about establishing urban villages by increasing density. In this particular case, it's not an urban village, but we do identify numerous sites throughout the city as minor intensification nodes, which are the same concept, but just on a much smaller scale. Uh, priority five, establish an urban redevelopment process that is financially feasible, predictable, and results in a net positive experience for neighborhoods. So by doing this, we are uh, enabling a higher quality development that's going to contribute more financially to the city and uh, facilitates that redevelopment of that site, which is currently uh, basically a dirt site. 
Uh, and based on this context of the surrounding area, medium density residential development on this site is appropriate. Uh, there's numerous apartments uh, in front of it, behind it, and surrounding that area. So this site is within the boundary of the Riverside Area Redevelopment Plan, which is a little bit more of a more recent ARP that was created. So objective A of that plan is to create a blueprint for strategic intensification and allowing for the planned uh, contextual intensification of the neighborhood with various built forms and pr proper locations. So this plan takes a look at the balance of the entire Riverside area and says where can we accommodate uh, additional density, where would it be appropriate, where is it not appropriate. So the subject site is located within the medium to high density area of that plan and it proposes that there's a, a variety of residential built forms and institutional uses. The site has a direct connection to the downtown via Finley Bridge and is near the commercial area along 3rd Street uh, and an increase in population in this area could help support both those commercial sites. Uh, the land use bylaw amendment to rezone the subject site is in alignment with the MDP and Riverside ARP. And then just from the regulatory context again, uh, we've already visited the, the development forms of medium density residential, so I don't think this is anything new tonight, but um, this particular one is unique in that it doesn't currently have any zoning on the site, so nothing can be proposed right now. Uh, so we, do, we are assigning a zoning to it. So here's some aerial photos of the site. So you can see the, it doesn't really show up as well on the screen here, but the, the white dashed long strip of, of land um, directly east of 2nd Avenue. And it's gonna be consolidated with the larger parcel uh, to the east of it. So this photo is taken from the north side of 2nd Street looking towards the front of the subject site. So the, the little strip of parcel is basically where the, the tree line starts to close to the roadway on the right hand side. And this photo is taken from 2nd Avenue, uh, northeast looking east towards the subject site. So it is recommended through the Municipal Planning Commission that City Council approve bylaw number 4810 to rezone lot 37 block three plan 3204 M to medium density residential district. Thank you, Manager Sissons. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay. Um, at this point, uh, I will ask City Clerk if there was any submissions, notifications. Thank you, Madam Chair. So public notice of bylaw 4810 was published in the Medicine Hat News on Saturday, March 16th and Saturday, March 23rd, same as the other previous two. Notification letter related to the proposed bylaw was mailed to 19 adjacent or abutting and other property owners in the general vicinity of this property on March 6, 2024, and no written submissions were received. Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk. Um, at this point, we will open the public hearing up to the gallery. If there is anyone in the gallery who would like to speak to this bylaw, please come down to the podium, state and spell your name, um, and state whether you are speaking for or against the bylaw. Hello, you can start by stating and spelling your name. Daniel Marion, D-A-N-I-E-L-M-A-R-I-O-N. I am against this bylaw. Okay. In fact, I'm against all three bylaws. I just wanted to wait to hear all of it, what you had to say before I responded. And you've given me a lot to speak to, so it's gonna be a bit. Buckle in. First off, what's best for the city? And please forgive my voice, I've been going through kind of a sore throat for the last week or so. What's best for the city, I don't think any of you have a true concept of. Only insofar as what I have personally witnessed through my awakening last summer to observing what your actions are. First off, until you, the council, can justify to us, the citizens, why hiring no less than six people who don't live in the city to work for it is best for the city, I don't think you got much to stand on. Secondly, Councillor Dumanowski, you mentioned that you live pretty much a stone's throw from all of these developments. 
I'm not sure why you're in favor of seeing your neighborhood turned into these medium density areas. The spaces can be used for much better things. For instance, city run gardens that can benefit employees of the city by running it and can be sold to the city at cheap two cubic foot box for two bucks. Everyone gets vegetables. Why is that a bad plan? Why do we have to put a five story building on these spaces? That doesn't make sense. I've chosen Medicine Hat as my retirement city for a reason, because it's not Calgary or Edmonton. It's a nice city. It's a good size. It's 20 minutes from anywhere you could possibly want to be. I've lived in this country from one end to the other in my own military career and my father's. I've lived in every mainland province. This is the best place to live, despite all your best efforts to convince me otherwise recently. The only people that are passionate about these developments are the ones who will benefit financially for them. And the people of Medicine Hat will not see the benefits of those profits as last summer proved to us all when we had vast profits and none of us saw any benefits from it until we complained. My land taxes are still going up. I'm still not seeing benefits of profits. The only people that will benefit is not us, the citizens who should be benefiting from these developments. Change them, think harder on them. Don't let your dollar signs blind your eyes. The people need more responsibility in this. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Mr. Marion. For a second time, if there is anyone in the gallery who would like to speak to this bylaw, please come down to the podium, state and spell your name, and state whether you are speaking for or against the bylaw. For a third and final time, if there's anyone in the gallery who would like to speak to this bylaw, please come down to the podium, state and spell your name, and state whether you're speaking for or against the bylaw. Okay. Seeing no further speakers, the public hearing is now closed at 8.16 p.m. So we have a recommendation before us, and I'm looking for a motion for second reading. I move the council give second reading to bylaw 4810. Second. All right, we will open the floor up to council discussion. This is a fairly simple adjustment that um, I understand. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Mayor Clerk. Go ahead. You're fine to go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would just like to speak to uh, the um, necessity that we have in our community for increased housing and the implications that increased, ha increased housing will have on our um, economic ability to develop economically because in order for people to work here, they have to be able to live here and afford to live here. And um, housing is a barrier for us. Available housing, attainable housing is a barrier for us as well as a lot of other cities, most other cities in, and towns in, in Alberta and across Canada. Uh, so this will not, the, the intention of increasing um, multifamily would be to increase affordability for residents of Medicine Hat in relation to housing, as well as provide available housing so that um, people can come work here and have a place to live. As mentioned earlier by Chair Knodel, um, there are a lot of people looking and unable to find housing. And so the, well, we don't want to change drastically change the character of any or I don't want to drastically change the character of any neighborhood and I understand that there are a variety of uses that that should be considered with respect to any infill infill parcel um, the need that we have uh, for housing in Medicine Hat really does weigh heavily on me um, and uh, I think a number of residents in in Medicine Hat and so um, that, that's why uh, the, the pursuit of, of multifamily on infill lots uh, is being pursued at this time. Thank you, Mayor Clark. Um, seeing no further speakers, 
Uh, we will vote on second reading. That's unanimous. Do I have a motion for third reading? Uh, I move the council give third and final reading to bylaw 4810, a bylaw of the city of Medicine Hat to amend the land use bylaw to rezone plan 3204M, block three, lot 37 to medium density residential district. I will second that motion. Are there any further comments or discussion? Okay, we will vote on third reading. That is unanimous, thank you. I'd like to make a motion that we recess until 8.30. Okay. Just in terms of people, since we're done the public hearings so that people can have a, a bio I'll break. second that. Sounds good, so we will return to our chairs. Um, what's that? Oh, okay, so, to, <laughs> all right, let's do it, let's vote. Councillor Hirsch, is it not working? Perfect, so we will return to our chairs at 8.30.
conduct. I will call the meeting to order at 8.30. Thank you for returning from the adventure to the bathroom. Okay, so uh, number 10 is unfinished business. Uh, we have bylaw 4805, the council code of conduct bylaw in front of us. Uh, our city managers is going to speak to this and our first reading was March 4th, 2024. Um, before we consider second and third reading, we're looking for comment from city manager Mitchell. Thank you, and I will turn it over to either City Solicitor Bullock or um, as soon as I'm done. We just wanted to mention that there are some changes in the Code of Conduct, as you know. Um, we've looked at various options, and I'll turn it over to City Solicitor Bullock to outline the changes and the options. Go ahead, Ben. Good evening. I think I'll just give an introduction and then I'm going to turn it over to Solicitor uh, Rex Osiv Wimu, who's here. He's a solicitor on our team who, uh, who worked on this project. Um, so just by way of introduction, so this late in 2022, administration was asked by the ALR committee to consider additional changes to the Council Code of Conduct bylaw. And so this project was added to uh, my department's uh, legislative action plan. Uh, through AL ALR committee, it was decided that the proposed changes to the bylaw would be brought forward in uh, Q1 of 2024. So first reading of this bylaw occurred last month. Uh, late in 2023, council passed a, mo uh, a resolution which directed staff to include a process in the bylaw that would allow city employees and the public to uh, bring complaints under the bylaw. And so uh, my team has prepared a bylaw in accordance with the directions received, and that's what you have before you tonight for second and third reading. Uh, much of the new uh, Code of Conduct bylaw remains substantially the same as the current bylaw. However, there are some key differences uh, which have been outlined for you in, in the briefing note report that you have in your agenda materials. Um, the bylaw was uh, reviewed and supported uh, at the Administrative and Legislative Review Committee at their meeting of February 13th of this year. So with that, I'll just ask Solicitor Rex to uh, just, just quickly just walk through the key changes to the bylaw. Uh, good evening for the Chair to Council. Thank you for having me uh, this evening. Um, so uh, as the City Solicitor said, I'm just going to run through uh, what key changes um, that we've made um, or we propose to the new bylaw. The first being um, that we have opened up um, the complaint process to members of the public, uh, municipal employees, as well as councillors themselves. Uh, the old bylaw did not have that. Um, the second uh, key change was we added a section <clears throat> that deals with the use of social media by councillors. Uh, with all that is going on currently, uh, I think that's something that uh, we, we need to consider in this new proposed bylaw. Uh, thirdly, um, we also added some sections dealing with discrimination and harassment, and certain prohibited uh, behaviors. Uh, that's dealt with in sections 8.1D and 8.3 of the proposed new bylaw. Uh, we also make reference to pecuniary interest, which was as per directive given to us by council resolution. Uh, so we've made attempt to to reflect that. In addition, we've also addressed the issues of conflict of interest, um, changed the language a bit uh, to make it more reflective and more meaningful. Um, we've added a deadline for making of complaints. Um, we've changed it, to, we've proposed 90 days. The reason being, um, we should have, if someone wants to make a complaint, the incident should be fresh in mind while the complaint is being made rather than 
coming a year down the road and saying you want to complain. Uh, seven, um, we've also proposed a new way of uh, completion of the initial assessment. So we receive a complaint. Who does the initial assessment? In this new bylaw, we propose the ALR um, to, to do the initial assessment. However, should the ALR feel that this is beyond their capacity, they then farm it out to a, an external investigator to do the initial assessment. The, we've also included um, that upon receipt of a complaint um, by an external investigator, the external investigator must complete that investigation within 90 days as well. So we can't just leave it flapping. We, we've tried to restrict the time frame so that it's judiciously done. Um, we've also added another section, a proviso, that any complaints that are received within two months of, an elect of a general municipal election, that that complaint will not be dealt with at that time, it will be dealt with after the election. So, so that's, um, that's a new uh, addition. Uh, we have further um, proposed ways of, rather than going through the complaint process, we could actually resolve things through mediation, um, through for, you know, formal, re informal resolution. So uh, it's not mandatory, it's not compulsory, and it's not a precursor to whether or not you have to go through that informal process before you're allowed to lodge your complaint. But as always, and as with all things, it's always better to uh, informally resolve rather than going through the whole process of, of formal complaints. Um, we have also added a clause, a section dealing with the retention of an independent third party outside of the council to actually do the investigation should any complaint arise. Uh, so it's an ad hoc retainer. So it won't be, it's not permanent, it's as the need arises. So we will call upon the third party to conduct the investigation. Another section, section 21, deals with the final decision as to whether there was a breach of the bylaw is, is wrestled the investigator. And the, that decision is final, is not subject to review by counsel. There will be, if there is found to be a breach, there will be a public release of investigation reports. And that's dealt with in section 22 as well. And then finally, we have we made additional provisions related to sanction process, um, just for clarity purpose. There's nothing much different from what was there before, just added a few words to make it clearer as to what can and what cannot be done. So that's, that's basically the few changes to the current bylaw that is being proposed. Thank you, Mr. Rex. Appreciate your presentation. And uh, I'm looking for a motion for second reading to open up to the discussion. I can make that motion, I guess. Uh, I feel like I've been up most of the night. Uh, so I move the council gives, oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Yeah, no, it's not, sorry. I move the council gives second reading to bylaw 4805. I'll second. Okay, so now we will again open up the floor to discussion. Uh, Councilor McGrogan. Thank you. Um, although I moved it, I guess I moved it for the sake of putting it on, on the floor and having the discussion. Uh, I've got a few points I've, in reflection of this. I'm chair of Admin and Ledge, and some of it comes through, I guess, the experience that we've been going through and, 
and just reading the bylaw over in my past life uh, as the police chief and the complaint process there, um, thinking it all through, I just have three or four points I'd like to make. And one is, uh, I'm going to start with, uh, on Friday, the Premier made a comment in the media that they were going to review the MGA to look at uh, the process, uh, the code of conduct process. So I think we need to consider that uh, strongly uh, the, as an issue. Secondly, uh, admin and ledge as the committee as a gatekeeper, I, I'm second guessing that. I, I really think that from, again, from the experience that we just went through, there's nine of us and we form relationships, we collaborate together, we work together and it's almost a counter uh, productive measure and it doesn't create unity and collaboration in the future. So um, I really wonder if admin and ledge should be the gatekeeper of these complaints. I'm getting second thinking. I know their lawyers in the room are probably rolling their eyes right now, but uh, I'm really concerned about that. And, and uh, the whole idea of an integrity commissioner, which I think the mayor mentioned as being supportive of that uh, when this came up the last time, I, I think in reflection of that, I actually, I do think that we should consider that for a couple of reasons. Number one is it allows, I guess, council to step back and not be the gatekeeper and be neutral. Um, and I, the cost benefit analysis, like let's do a cost benefit of what is, if we're just going to send this out to mediators and lawyers and whatever have you not, uh, we, we have to do an analysis of what it's costing us right now, but in the future, how can we allow our citizens? So I want to say that I agree with most of the big blocks and the principles of people being able to complain about council, staff being able to complain about council, um, trying to tighten up the timelines, agree with all that. But what is this going to cost us at the end of the day for some of these complaints, which in some cases could be relatively trivial, but we can all dig our trenches and get in there and we can fight and we can get lawyers. And, and how are we serving the citizens in the community by doing that? Uh, so I guess that's kind of where I'm at with this. And the last thing is this 90 day thought process of, con of the investigator completing the process, again, from my past life, I do not think it's realistic because people take time to respond. There, it takes time to put the process forward. So I don't know if 90 days is realistic, although it's, it would be very nice, but I don't think it's always possible. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that we send this back and say, okay, where should we go with this that takes admin and ledge out of the gatekeeper position? Have we really looked at the integrity commissioner as a possibility and what is the cost benefit analysis of that versus we're all just going to get lawyers and run, in our, run to our corners, dig our trenches. So how do we get past that? So I guess that's my comments. I'd like to hear what other councillors have to say. I, I just, I'm very reluctant right now to pass this as it stands. I actually won't support it. All right, councillor Robbins. Yeah, uh, thank you. And through the chair, um, I, I uh, first want to thank you for your presentation, Mr. Osman. Awesome. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Um, and the changes that you've made and how you've summarized them so concisely. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. I'm not sure if you were the person who drafted the briefing note or that was City Solicitor Bullock or both of you working together. But I found the briefing note quite helpful in the options laid out, um, actually. Uh, and I will say that so. Before I um, decided to run for council, I did review codes of conduct from other similar sized cities to sort of understand what Medicine Hat said versus what others said. And there were some gaps there. And that's not a criticism to whoever drafted the old code of conduct. The MGA required one and it had to be put into place. Um, but without the ability of public or members of staff or anyone else to make a complaint, it's really a very narrow document. Um, and so I noted that others had addressed things as well, like social media, pecuniary interest, conflict of interest. So I wasn't doing a big scan for any legal purpose. I just was sort of curious about what other cities were doing. And um, so I'm, I'm glad to see the changes proposed. And I agree with the, the changes. Where I'm stuck um, is we did have a conversation with a number of councillors 
at Alberta municipalities. So quite a few of us went to Alberta municipalities in September this year, and there was a session on code of conduct, coincidentally. And so quite a number of us attended that. I don't remember exactly who, but uh, quite a few of us did. Um, and there was some discussion there about how code of conduct investigations were becoming more common and smaller municipalities were really struggling with being able to pay for those things, like where was the budget for them, and some discussion of whether there should be some advocacy out of Alberta municipalities to the provincial government to create an integrity commissioner for municipalities. And so um, that was just a discussion in the air. Uh, after the session, we learned a lot about codes of conduct. Um, in it and how they're drafted and what they're intended to do, which was all really valuable. But this discussion sort of burbled around a little bit and sort of um, occurred to me as I was um, reviewing the options uh, available. Um, the ALR committee, as the gatekeeper, I guess, um, which is one option that we've been given a, as an option, I think that... Um, they could find themselves in conflict quite a bit. Uh, I think there's some times when um, a complaint could be made that um, Councillor McGrogan's right, there's nine people working on a group project here, and so that involves spending time together, and it's really hard to um, make decisions. So I, I, I'm not sure that the ALR committee is the right way to do that. All Council Committee of the Whole, which is option three, same issue. Um, and then the uh, idea of in establishing or creating an independent office of the integrity commissioner. So while I really like that option, it does have a cost associated with it, first of all. And then I have lots of practical questions which are not gonna get answered here today, but who does the person work for? Who pays them? If they have travel expenses, who signs that bill? How do we make sure that the integrity commissioner is actually independent from the city of Medicine Hat? without um, paying counsel to, constant, uh, you know, to constantly review um, if that's going to be the case, because then the costs, if you're contracting it, are not really controlled, whereas an integrity commissioner, we would be able to understand this is how much it costs a year to make sure when people make a complaint about counsel that someone who is qualified and independent reviews it. So for me, I like the code of conduct, I like the way it's drafted, I like the accountability in it, I like it all very much. I don't think we've quite worked out that other pieces. Once we have that um, violation, who is going to be the person who reviews it? And that's, I mean, you've given us one option. Um, you've given us many options in the briefing note as well. And I lean towards wanting to ask for more information about an integrity commissioner. And I do note that in the briefing note, it describes other municipalities who have approach that, that you've highlighted there, Edmonton, Calgary, Wood Buffalo, Red Deer. And so I'd like to know more about what they're doing. And then like to mo know more if the government of Alberta has any plans about establishing in their review of the code of their code of conduct requirements, their own integrity commissioner, because that was a pretty loud voice from other municipalities. So while I support um, the accountability in the code of conduct, and I have no issue with it, and I'd be quite happy when anyone complains about me to say what I did and why, as I always will. Um, I'm not sure we have the, the review piece quite right, and I do like option four, but I'd like to know more about how their municipalities are funding it and keeping that person independent. Thank you. City Manager Mitchell and then Mayor Clark. Thank you, and through the chair, we did have some cursory discussions with some other municipalities, both here in Alberta and other provinces. Um, I think everybody's familiar with Ontario. It's now legislated that you must have an integrity commissioner. Um, I do agree that removing it doesn't, you know, um, Councillor McGrogan's concerns with council reviewing council complaints. I do agree with that. Um, the city of Red Deer does have a budget of 105,000 for the integrity commissioner. Um, I talked to the city manager today. She she said they don't normally go through the budget, but it's not just to deal with the concerns or complaints. That amount is also for workshops for council, and also if councils had any questions about about, you know, do I have a pecuniary interest? Can I talk to you about that? So it wasn't just complaints. So 
a similar size city in Ontario, um, City of Thunder Bay, it's about 110,000. They have an integrity commissioner. Their budget is 25,000, and I don't know if the difference is because it's enshrined in legislation or not, but they rarely use the 25,000. So I do think that if you give us a bit of time, we could come back with a broader cross-Canada -Can jurisdictional scan. Thank you, City Manager. Mayor Clark? Uh, thank you. I would like to make a motion um, to refer the Code of Conduct bylaw number 4805 back to administration to bring forward for council consideration one, establishing a position of integrity commissioner that is independent of both administration and council, two, amending bylaw 4805 to make the that integrity commissioner position responsible for all aspects of administration of complaints under bylaw 4805, including but not limited to the acceptance of the complaint, initial assessment of the complaint, investigation of the complaint, informal resolution of the complaint, formal resolution of the complaint and sanctions. Amending number three, Amending section 18.4 of bylaw 4805 to reflect that a complaint must be received by the integrity commissioner not later than 90 days after the date the person became aware of the conduct giving rise to the complaint and that the integrity commissioner may use their discretion to grant extensions of this deadline um, if the delay occurred in good faith. It is in the public interest to conduct an investigation or to give consideration whether to conduct an investigation and no substantial pre prejudice will result to any person because of the delay. And Rondi has that language, so. Yes, of course, go ahead. Thank you, through the chair. Just to your motion, Mayor Clark, um, would you be interested in also administration exploring the possibility of the integrity commissioner giving advice to council or do you want to leave that off your motion? Um, I think the integrity commissioner position could be defined more expansively than just accepting um, complaint like the administration of complaints. I think there's an op a good opportunity to have education as well as as you mentioned the um, invest, uh, helping counselors determine whether they have a pecuniary interest. I also know that we'll be reviewing the whistleblower policy soon and they may also potentially have a role in that. Does that need, do we need to amend the? Council Yeah, that's what, that's what, thank you. Thank you, that was what I was gonna ask. So there's a motion on the floor, what do we, how do we, uh, I guess move into this one. Do, is it how does that look? I guess I refer to the city clerk. Yep. Thank, thank you very much. So that is simply a motion to refer. It's called a subsidiary motion. So it goes back to administration to examine these uh, options that are presented and what's uh, on the screen there, and then brought back to council for future consideration. And it's still the bylaw will sit at second reading but pending the outcome of the referral back to council after administration has had time to do that work. I'll second Mayor Clark's motion. We will vote sorry. on the motion. Oh yeah, go ahead. I guess Just we a would, point sorry, of order. discussion first and no, then, yeah. actually I have a point of order. Yeah. I think Councillor McGrogan made a motion already. So that motion hasn't been dealt with. So does that, sorry, Jeff, just if you could clarify. Well, maybe the rest of you Go know, ahead. but my understanding is that motion has to be dealt with. Sure, I can explain that, Thank or I'll so try much. to explain it sure. uh, again. So the bylaw was moved and seconded without a vote on it. It's being debated, and during that period of debate, another decision has been made. Well, we haven't voted on, on the uh, proposal gotcha. yeah. to uh, yeah. refer it to administration, anyway. but if that motion passes, then that's what occurs, and then, like I say, it, it'll come back and be sitting at second reading uh, pending those proposed amendments. Thank you. My bad. As soon You're as welcome. you started talking, I'm like, oh, no, I know this. I all, all good. It's yeah. not uh, easy stuff. It's uh, none of us were born with those kind of uh, rules in our heads, that's for sure. So thank you. Correct. Um, 
so Councilor McGrogan, I've got your name on the list here. Do you, are you still waiting? Okay, uh, Councilor Hirsch, you have a comment? Well, I just do. Um, just reading that uh, request, I'm just in my mind, which is, I don't have a problem referring back to ALNR, that's for sure. And, and Councilor McGrogan, you indicated some things that give me some pause that I would like and appreciate a little bit of work on that, including the 90 days, et cetera. What I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about this motion is the fact that it's um, prescriptive already. Like it, in some ways it's already telling us what to expect coming back to us. Whereas I want the ability for us to have that review. You included 90 days of a concern because it could be a, in some cases longer. Um, I don't know, uh, I just wrote down here cost uh, of, the of the commissioner, the utilization of the, of the individual as a staff member. Also is there economies of scale that we could share with other municipalities quite frankly uh, in the utilization of that individual to save as well because all we're talking about is a third party independent so therefore could be used from other um, so I want to try and give as much latitude as I can to the review before it comes back and I feel that this is a bit at this point in time it's prescriptive and I don't know enough about what we could do with it and I'd love, love to go back to give you more latitude than what this is presenting that's all thanks Thank you, Councillor Hirsch. Mayor Clark? Yes, just a couple of corrections, uh, and this is my bad because uh, I spoke it differently than I sent it to um, the to Randy. So um, in the referral, remove um, a briefing note. So it's just saying back, um, back to administration to bring forward for council consideration and then remove of at the end of that line. And then number two should be amending should have, amend should have ing at the end. And same with in three. Um, and Madam Chair, if I could also respond to the concerns about the, the motion. Yes, go ahead. Um, I would expect that when administration brought back these items for council consideration, there would be background information, including jurisdictional scan, pros and cons, costs, et cetera, um, that, it, that it would be sort of in the normal course of administration bringing something to council where, you know, we receive a briefing note and it has the justification or um, why it's a good idea or a bad idea, and I would expect a jurisdictional scan to be part of that as well. Councilor McGrogan. Yeah, thank you. So I, I really I like this, and I but I, I am concerned it's prescriptive, and I'm just wondering if we could just have kind of a number four boilerplate on there, potentially just saying and other things surface through the review. I know it's going to come back with probably different recommendations, but this is quite defined and I'm just wondering if uh, if a number four like a some kind of a basket phrase that would say you know through this review if there's any other best practices that have been surfaced to bring them to council for review as well I don't know something of that nature I'm just again throw that out there for uh, discussion or comment city manager Mitchell Thank you through the chair or because we are all here and listening to the discussion, we could just say refer it back to staff and bring it back with these considerations. And then we don't have to worry about the prescriptiveness and staff will come back with our recommendations. Uh, Mayor Clark. Thank you through the chair. The intention is to be somewhat prescriptive. I do want something to come back to us with an integrity commissioner and as as a for council consideration, what their job duties might, like what all the job duties might be, what the cost might be, how that might look. Um, so that the intention of the motion is to be prescriptive in that way from my perspective. Thank you, Mayor Clerk. Councillor Robbins. 
Yeah, thank you, and through the chair, I, I don't mind the prescriptiveness of the motion either because when I look at the other available options, asking for more information, well, I really would like it to be about this integrity commissioner specifically. Option two is excluding ALR, which we've had some discussion of already, allowing council the whole, like of the options available, um, I lean towards an integrity commissioner because the rest of them involve the ALR committee. And um, so I, I personally don't mind that it's prescriptive to narrow down to if we have an integrity commissioner, what else can we find out? And while I'm speaking of the prescription, prescriptive nature of it, um, I do agree with the amendments in, in, in uh, paragraph three um, about the, the timing of it, although it would be interesting to see what other jurisdictions have done about that. But I, um, on the surface of it without knowing more information yet, I think those requests make sense to me. And I know, it, I get that it's prescriptive, but when I look at what the other options are, Council Committee of the Whole or ALR Committee, this one seems to be the one I'd like to have a detailed pursuit of, as opposed to, let's look at them all again. I really would like to narrow down for, for admin that this is the one that, that I'd like the most information about. And if in discussing it, when it comes up again, that is clear that it's not going to work out, then we could ask to look at another option. But personally, I don't mind the prescriptive nature of the, the motion. Thank you, Councillor Robbins. Councillor Dubinowski? Uh, through the chair, good discussion. I, um, my only addition would be that um, I don't think I'm sensing there's any um, challenge with an integrity commissioner uh, being in, kind of integrated into or added to the to the bylaw amendments. I think we we've all come through whatever angle of this process we like uh, that that there would be inherent value in that. Um, certainly, in kind of an environmental scan of other like communities would be a value. I think we're all in agreement, anecdotally at least, with that. The time frame piece was something um, I thought was of great value in addition. I also like the fact that it gives some extension. My, my only thought would be rather than argue about um, prescriptive or recommendation, it does say at the beginning uh, to forward for council consideration. To me that is, uh, that word is, acts sufficiently to say there's some level of specificity here that we'd like to see. but. But it, it isn't um, isn't a mandate for staff to go back and um, directly include these. But I think there's strong consideration, uh, as the word indicates. So, uh, if it's worded as such, to me, I think that meets the litmus test for both sides of the argument. Which is, let's, we'd like to see these looked at. We'd like to have some um, higher um, view and insight into them, as far as other municipalities are concerned or considering, um, and ultimately, we're, we're happy with some of the language around integrity, commissioner, and timing, et cetera. So I don't, I think it meets, it meets everyone's needs here, so I will be supporting as it's worded up there. Councillor Hirsch, oh, Councillor Sharps, and then Councillor Hirsch, apologies. That's okay, through the chair. Um, Mayor Clark, would you be open to a friendly addition amendment? So everything as is, I'm okay with prescriptive as well, but I wouldn't mind, so I was at RMA two weeks ago, the week of March 18th, lots of conversation around conflict of interest, uh, the, this entire thing, there was a, a, a whole afternoon spent on it with the minister, so it was very interesting. Um, and the one of the things that I sat with Cypress County, so that was great sitting with our partners, but one of the things that we're hearing uh, from the ministers and from around the table was to really quantify and clarify the public com component of it. So I'm a big believer that the public should be able to, but I think it needs to be kind of tightened up. So it's not about the public um, hearing from a friend, hearing from a friend that I did this and I want to put in a complaint. So it really needs to be tightened up that what is that relationship. So as, as a city official, they wouldn't be able to put in a complaint against me unless it was an interaction between us two. So in the same token, I would like to see that really tightened up between the public too. The, the whole point of this is for the public to be able to hold us accountable, but not to hear from a friend, from a friend, from a friend that so-and-so 
I heard did this. So it's getting, it's just gonna inundate the integrity commissioner and start to be very vexatious and frivolous. So trying to minimize the vexatious and frivolous. But I don't know how to word that in like a sentence. Would you be open to that, Mayor Clark? My preference yeah. would be to deal with this motion and then if we wanted to make another motion, I know it's gonna be, re if we pass this, it'll be referred, but would th there would still be an opportunity to make an additional motion to consider the items that Council Sharps. So two motions or just send it back? <laughs> Go ahead, uh, City Clerk. Thank you. A couple different ways to do it as is being discussed, but my recommendation would be you know, if there's maybe different thoughts on how to proceed from this point, if Councillor Sharps were to actually make a proposed amendment to what we're seeing there, if it's seconded, debated, and then voted on, if it passes, then you will vote on that motion as we see it, mm -hmm. as has been amended. Or if that proposed second amendment should fail, then we're back to square one, and you would be then voting on the motion that's up on the screen. Uh, Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, and I guess that's why I'm going back to the idea. Like, I, I'm, again, I'm not going to support the motion because, again, we talk about being prescriptive, and in some ways, we're doing now a motion on the fly. Can, can we? Will you accept that? I, I'm in favor of it going back to refer exactly for all the language that's been talked about here, and in fact, we're trying already to throw ideas in terms of how it comes back. And I want that discussion at the admin and ledge review so that we can have a full-fledged discussion and then come back educated on all the pieces. So again, I won't support that. I'll support the original motion that's on the table about the referral back to ALNR, and I'm good with that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hirsch. Mayor Clark? Uh, I think I just accidentally had my button left on, sorry. No problem. Okay, so we have, uh, and now I have Council Hirsch again, you're done, right? Okay, um, so we have a motion on the floor. Um, we will vote on this particular motion. If this goes forward, then uh, it will come back to us from staff. Um, and if not, then we will vote on the original motion. Perfect, okay, all right, we will vote. All right, so that uh, is defeated, unfortunately, um, but we will still have the opportunity to have the, the, the discussion um, as we are now going to vote on the original motion, and we can still have those proposed uh, suggestions come forward through ALR. Um, uh, Councillor Hirsch. My voting button seems to be stuck. Oh, I guess she hasn't cleared it yet. Um, so again, just for clarity, can, can and, and again for the viewing public and to understand that the intention here is absolutely go back to ALNR, have a full-fledged review. I think going back to Manning, or sorry, City Manager uh, Mitchell indicating that she has a good understanding that we're looking for the integrity commissioner. Again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with again being prescriptive at this point because I wanna have that discussion on what 90 days looks like what, what instances where that's been excluded or more than that? Because I, I think I want to have that understanding in terms of some of the best practices. I've already mentioned the idea of utilization of economies of scale of a uh, integrity commissioner borne by two communities or that sort of thing. And I just want to have that discussion on a full-fledged amount where I feel it's a little bit limiting on what the original motion was. So I'm here to accept the one that's uh, presented as it is right now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hirsch. Before I turn it over to Councillor Sharps, um, City Manager, can you just share back with me the essence of what we saw in Mayor Clark's um, proposal, proposed motion, kind of like down to the three bullet points of um, we need to see this, this, and this, and that those things will come forward in the recommendation that will go to ALR. I'm just 
I just want to make sure that we're on the same page so that when it comes back, we see those things even in a, in a more um, open-ended formula. Thank you. Through the chair, the essence of what I'm understanding and hearing here from council is that council is really interested in delving in further to the integrity commissioner option, doing not only a jurisdictional scan, but looking at the various things that an integrity commissioner could offer. Um, one of them being complaints, the second being counselors' um, advice on pecuniary interest, and the third being workshops or education for members of council. Um, with regards to Mayor Clark's motion too, there's also the need and desire to look at the 90-day window and how does that work in the other jurisdictions that we look at. Uh, you also want to hear about the budget, you want to hear about the costs, so we'll be looking at various municipalities across the country, but also in Alberta, and we'll also look at the legislation in the other provinces as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, City Manager. And the one thing that I think I would love to tweak, if we could, um, is just the concerns about how public complaints function, and um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Can I have a point, make a point of Absolutely. order to Councillor Hirsch's point? The motion on the table is second reading of this bylaw. Yes. So that's the motion that's on the table right now. Um, so understood. I, I, the reason why I checked in with city manager is because that second, I understand process. Yeah, Sorry. got it. So we can vote on second reading. That will give us the opportunity to tweak our discussion, well, we, it'll get us, is it not on, on the floor though, at this current point in time? Yes, Madam yes. Chair, so it, so second reading is, is what's before council right now. Right. There's, there's no referral to a committee pending. Okay. That motion hasn't been made or one that was, was defeated to uh, refer to admin. So now it's back to the original motion, moved and seconded, second reading sits before you right now. So just to clarify, it is, um, and to hear what you've said, it is an inappropriate, you're telling me it's an inappropriate time to make any recommendations or communicate with the city manager. I'm just clarifying, is that what you're telling me? No, okay. Okay, so we will vote on, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, oh, okay. sorry. No problem. and Larry's got his button on there, sorry. Okay. Um, no, it's not, because you're referring it back to staff, so it's absolutely good and appropriate, and okay. we appreciate the feedback and going through the list to make sure we're capturing the essence of what council is directing us to do, so Perfect. absolutely appropriate, thank okay. you. Just wanted to make sure everyone's heard. Um, Councillor Sharps? Thank you, and through the chair. Um, I just wanted to clarify, again, to the public, and I think sometimes when they're, we're hearing these debates, I think they think that we're um, not always agreeing. I think everybody in the room actually agrees with what Mark Clark brought forward. It's just that there's other things. So instead of having five motions on the table, we're just sending it back. I think they've heard it loud and clear, so who wants to come back here with half of it done? But we also don't want to keep sending it back because it needs to um, be heard by everybody. And process is, my understanding, and I've been schooled lots of times, shy that it goes back to, it goes back to committee. So I think that we need to stick to our processes and going back to committee. But I think there's more than one change. I totally actually have no problem with Mayor Clark's um, suggestions. I just think there's a lot more on the table. That's all. So I just wanted to clarify that for the public. Thank you, Councillor Sharps. Um, would council be, oh, we have Councillor Robbins. And then I will make my question. Sorry, Councillor Robbins, go ahead. That's all right, thank you, and through the chair. I would like to make a motion to refer this item back to ALR committee for review um, based on City Manager Mitchell's summary of our discussion. Second. Can I make a friendly amendment before we vote? Um, can I make a friendly amendment that we include a date? And can I ask that you make that revision? Councillor uh, Robbins? Sure, sure. If, if uh, City Clerk Randall tells me I can, I, I, I had thought of including a date, actually, and I, when I looked over at City Manager Mitchell, I was going to ask her what she thought an appropriate date was, or City Solicitor Bullock may have an opinion, but I'll ask the City Manager, who will probably ask him. Through the Chair, Chair McGrogan, when is the next, and then the next ALR committee?
So you're going to make me look my schedule up. Um, hold on a sec. So. It's May 14th. May 14th? No. Nope. Yeah, so it is May 14th is the next uh, meeting. Yep. And then the following one is the 11th of, of June. Of June. I'm turning it over to City Solicitor Book of because he knows his workflow better than I do. Go ahead, Ben. Through the chair, yeah, it's kind of hard to say how long this is going to take. Um, I prefer the June date. There, there's a fair bit of work that you've asked us to do here, and keeping in mind that uh, the report is going to probably go through Administrative Committee first uh, before going to ALR Committee. That, that factors into the timing. Um, we can shoot for June. Um, we'll do our best, but we may need more time. Go can ahead. I just to finish mm -hmm. my um, say, we added to the outstanding items list of ALR committee for quarter two of 2024. So our next step before I turn the mic over to Council Dumanowski, we need to vote on the friendly amendment. So we will do that once Rondi has drafted the um, motion by Councillor Robbins. Just a point of order. Absolutely. Um, acting worship. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand. So we have second reading of the bylaw on mm -hmm. the floor because of the previous friendly uh, or the amendment, proposed amendment to that bylaw was defeated mm -hmm. by tie. So that would refer us back to second motion of the bylaw. So is this referral a friendly amendment yes referrals are considered friendly amendments i'm sorry the date was the, the date friendly was amendment. but yes so i yeah i'm just trying to understand maybe city clerk can clarify would we not refer back to the secondary about since that's on the floor or can we just in the bad uh, back in the day we would table we don't use that anymore so do we, is this just a referral, a, a circumventing now that, that the fact that the second reading is on the floor? I'm just trying to understand it so that procedurally we get this right. Go ahead, yeah. City Clerk. Thank you for the question, Councillor McGrogan, through the chair. Uh, pardon me, Dumanowski. If you had names like Smith and Jones, it would make things a little bit easier for me, I'm sorry. So, yeah, again, let, let's go back to where we started, we have a, a mover and a seconder for second reading of the bylaw. That's pending, nothing has been decided. Now, while that is pending, and this is legitimate in parliamentary procedure, to refer a pending motion to a committee for further work to come back to the main body, in this case, council, for consideration at that time. And City, that works. City Clerk, the third layer is the friendly amendment on top of that, that referral to AL, ALR. Is that correct? So we'd go th friendly, uh, vote on friendly amendment, vote on referral, or do we even need to do those separately? My, my recommendation would be you don't need to vote on the addition to that motion. It, n nobody's voted on it. It was moved and seconded. If the mover and the seconder are fine with it, that's the motion that I think should be voted okay. on at this point. Okay. Councillor Dumanowski. Sounds really good. No, I just, it, I, I think that's why you're here. You get paid the big bucks to guide us. But um, this uh, being referred back um, outside of the fact that the second ring is on the floor is a little bit confusing to me, but um, I understand we're all on the same page here, so let's, let's go with it. Thank you, Councillor Dumanowski. We will vote on the referral to ALR committee by the end of Q2. That is unanimous. And City Clerk, just to clarify, um, do we need any other voting? Uh, do we need to vote on the second, mo the second reading at this point in time, or is the referral um, adequate? The referral takes care of that business for this evening. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you for your support. I really appreciate it. OK. So um, we have, let's just see. So that was our code of conduct. We now are under. Uh, 
11, new business. We are looking at 11.1 .1 procedure bylaw amendment, bylaw 4815. Uh, our sponsor is again, City Manager Mitchell, and we have a recommendation that council considers all three readings of bylaw 4185 to amend the procedure bylaw. Uh, City Manager, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, and I will let uh, Clerk Randall highlight this because he's the actual author of this, this report. This was a direction, previous direction and resolution of council, and we're bringing it back. It's a small housekeeping matter. So I will turn it over to you, Larry. Yeah. Thank you, CAO Mitchell, through the chair. Uh, so as noted, um, at the March 4th regular council meeting, there was a motion adopted directing administration to provide some recommended amendments to the procedure bylaw that would create a council agenda review committee that would include the city manager, the city clerk, the mayor, the deputy mayor, and the acting mayor or their delegates. So up to five people. Currently, the procedure bylaw is written such that that agenda review committee includes the mayor, the city manager and the city clerk only. So it's proposing an addition of acting mayor and deputy mayor to that agenda approval committee. As well, there were just a couple other very small housekeeping changes proposed with this. And one is currently the way the bylaw is written, it says that the agenda review committee must meet at least five days before the council meeting to kind of decide on the final version of the agenda. But when there is a holiday Monday, sometimes that bumps things a day and we end up having only four days. So we don't follow the procedure by law if we do that. So we're proposing to change that uh, advance uh, you know, timeline from five days just down to four. And then the definition of city, city clerk, pardon me, uh, required amendments just to be uh, accurate fully. And that's uh, the, the crux of it right there. Thank you. Do we, oh, yep, go ahead, Councillor Robbins. I was just wondering, do we want to put, the, uh, get first reading on the table before we make any discussions, or would you like to? I just had a question yeah, for clarity, absolutely. just before we proceed any further. So um, the proposal is three councillors as defined, but you said five, and maybe you lost me there. Yeah. Pardon me if, if I did, uh, Councillor uh, Robbins through the chair. So currently there are three people, three, three positions, and that's the mayor, city manager, and city clerk. So we're looking for the addition of two to total three elected officials, mayor, deputy mayor, acting mayor. Does that clarify? Thank you. For you, some reason welcome. I had in my mind it would be five councillors, and that seemed terribly wrong to me. So thank you for clarifying who the five would be. You're Thanks. welcome. Okay. Um, do we have a motion for first reading? I'll move that Council give first reading to bylaw 4815, a bylaw of the City of Medicine Hat to amend the procedure bylaw. Do we have a seconder? Second. All right, we will vote. After first reading. Okay, that's unanimous. I apologize for not announcing it quickly and listening to my neighbor here. Okay, so um, uh, that is unanimous. Uh, I will open the floor to discussion. Um, okay, I'm getting distracted. All right. I move um, the council give you. second reading to bylaw 4815. All right. Second. All right, and we will vote. No, back to discussion now. All right. Okay, we will open the floor to discussion and then we will vote. Councillor Robbins. I was so quick on the button I got in first. Um, I'm going to support this, uh, this change. There are times when the mayor is not in town and not able to attend. And I think there's also times when having three councillors, and because it's rotating, so it'll be two different people with the mayor all the time, I think that when we're, there's three people who are identifying political or community issues, it probably has more, um, impact or, or force if it comes from a larger voice. Um, not that Mayor Clark can't advocate, but I think it's helpful to hear from the different aspects of the community as, as well, especially when the only two other members of the committee are city manager and city clerk. I think that, and I do appreciate, sorry, and that's not a criticism of anyone, I'm just thinking it's a better process. And when I look at the 
jurisdictional scan of what other people are doing. It makes a lot of um, sense and does line up with some other best practices. So I will be supporting it. Thank you, Councillor Robbins. Councillor Hyder. Thank you through the chair. Uh, I too echo Councillor Robbins' voice and, and words. Um, it's a great opportunity for us to get involved in the um, process of the agenda and I'm looking forward to the opportunity. Thank you, Councillor Hyder. Any other speakers? Okay, with that, we will vote. That is unanimous. Okay, do we have a motion for third reading? Point of order, we would need a motion for unanimous consent, okay. and then unanimous consent. Thank you. Okay, do we have a motion for unanimous consent, and then third reading? I move the council unanimously consents to have third reading to bylaw 4815 at this, at this meeting. Second. Thank you. Um, and we will vote. That is unanimous. Okay, looking for a motion for third reading. I move that council gives third and final reading to bylaw 4815, a bylaw of the City of Medicine Hat to amend the procedure bylaw. Second. Okay, we will vote. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Okay, item 11.2. Uh, is rotating council chair, representative for future meetings, sponsor city manager. We have a recommendation in front of us that the duties of the mayor related to chairing meetings and attending the administrative committee meetings be undertaken by the councillors in the position of deputy mayor or acting mayor on the 45 day rotating schedule. Um, three regular Medicine Hat City Council oh, on uh, April 8th, 2024 established at the beginning of the council term pursuant to the procedure bylaw for as long as uh, the mayor is unable to perform those duties. City Manager, would you like to speak to this? Thank you. As again, this was authored by City Clerk. I will turn it over to City Clerk Randall for an overview. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So uh, again, just noting at the March 21st, 2024 special meeting of Council, it was asked that Council address the appointment of a rotating chair for future meetings and a replacement representative of council to attend administration committee meetings at the next regularly scheduled meeting. So in, in our view and you know, having worked with uh, some other administration on, on this, there wasn't really a, a whole lot to, to work with or decide. It's, it's clearly laid out in the procedure bylaw as it stands that uh, uh, eight council members on a rotating basis, 45 day rotating basis works out you know, essentially to a full year. Uh, to share the roles of acting mayor and deputy mayor. So that, uh, you know, the recommendation I think kind of speaks for itself. Uh, I don't know if council was looking for something more or something deeper that we as administration overlooked, but we just see it as, you know, follow the procedure bylaw and, and I think, you know, we're, we're solid with what council was looking for. Thank you, City Clerk. So my understanding is that no motion is required for this. I do see you, Councillor Robbins, I'll just make this statement because the procedure bylaw already accommodates this re recommendation, but confirmation and verbal direction is helpful to staff. Am I getting that right? Okay, perfect. Councillor Robbins and then Mayor Clerk. Yeah, I think for my part, I just wanted to ensure that any schedule was published. I know we do publish who the next series of deputy mayor acting mayor is, but I thought it was important that the community be able to easily access that information. So if it's easily available, if we can identify that, where people can find it, and if not, if we could make it available, that would be helpful. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Robbins. Mayor Clark? Thank you. Um, I understand that this is just for information, um, but I do object to the briefing note saying that I'm unable to perform my duties as I am able to perform my duties. Um, and so I, I do object to the usage of that term, unable. Um, and uh, in addition, the, the fact that it, the procedure bylaw in terms of chairing cannot be amended by a, a resolution or a motion, but 
um, we're just receiving this for information, but I just wanted my objection noted. Okay, so uh, city clerk, is it uh, possible to make a revision um, or re reflect the request for a revision with wording or the verbiage there? Would we need a motion to do so? I, you know, if there's no objection, I think we, we heard what the mayor said and uh, apologies uh, for you know trying to select the right wording there and, and uh, it's preferred that a different term be used rather than unable. Um, I don't know if there's something maybe that could be suggested if there's another term that would be preferable and we could go back, amend this uh, briefing note and just you know, keep it as the permanent record with an amended word in place of the word unable. Thank you, City Clerk. Okay, so we are gonna move on to 11.3, Council Motions, uh, grant program sponsor. This is uh, Managing Director Stouth. Uh, we have a recommendation in front of us that Council extends delivery timelines for the report or reports related to grant criteria for nonprofit agencies by directing administration to develop and present the report in Q3 2024. Uh, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. And uh, <clears throat> through the Chair to uh, all of Council, certainly this, uh, um, this uh, briefing note speaks to uh, what we've got available in the capacity box on February 20th. Council passed a motion for a multifaceted uh, um, report to be created uh, talking about criteria, eligibility criteria for Council's review with recommendation about different options for the amount of grant money dedicated to the program and the impact of any loss or investment income to the city. Uh, so we certainly have started on this, but we uh, also want to do a thorough jurisdictional scan to see uh, how other municipalities in the province, uh, what criteria they've created for uh, grant programs for nonprofits. Uh, we'd like to get it right, and uh, we we are doing it in-house, so it's going to be cheap. Um, but if you want it fast, it won't be good, and if you want it good, it won't be fast. So um, we're just asking uh, for time for us to bring this report back in Q3 of this year so they can be thorough uh, and it can have uh, a wholesome analysis done on it. And we can time this uh, to, to um, uh, come back to Council in conjunction with some other things that we are, are, re are working on related to uh, community funding so Council can have a, a wholesome big picture look. Thank you, Managing Director South, uh, Councillor Robbins. Thank you, and through the chair, I just sorry, turn my button off. Just wonder how that um, uh, that new timeline affects our budget considerations, because part of the consideration of what this could be is going to be informed by what the budget discussions are. So, just wonder if that affects those timelines in any way. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Robbins. Uh, we are, um, it, it is a consideration, but in fact, it's, it's the budget that we're working on now that's creating the capacity problem for us to work uh, on this project. Um, we have uh, talked to finance and said, listen, we'll, we'll need some placeholders uh, as we consider uh, what capital requirements may be going into the 25-26 budget cycle. Uh, and and so there are placeholders for us to hold and for council to debate in that regard uh, later in the year. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions or comments for Managing Director Stouth? Okay. I'd like to make a motion if I could, Madam Perfect. Chair. Absolutely. Um, I move that Council extends the delivery timelines for administration to deliver the reports related to grant criteria for nonprofit agencies as requested by Council in the February 20th, 24 regular meeting to quarter three of 2024. I'll second that, Councillor Robbins. Okay, we will vote.
and that passes. Thank you. Um, item number 11-4 is renaming of boardroom 21 Ted Grimm Conference Room. Uh, sponsor is city manager, and we have a recommendation that council approves the renaming of boardroom 21 to the Ted Grimm Conference Room in honor of former mayor Ted Grimm. City manager. Thank you, through the chair. We did have this request um, before us for a while. City clerk and I, and I'm going to tax his memory on how we, I asked the city clerk to dig and just see if there was an actual resolution of council or if it was a direction of council. So this report is coming forward. It's been lagging a bit and we wanna make sure that it's in front of council. And I will let city clerk Randall give some highlights on the time frame. thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, this issue of naming the conference room after the late Mayor Ted Grimm, well before he died, was introduced, I think, way back in 2001. And we looked through all the city records through closed meetings, open meetings, you know, agendas, minutes, and everything we could find. And it kind of went back and forth. And we determined that there was never any, we couldn't find any evidence at least, of a clear motion made in an open meeting directing administration to proceed with you know, renaming uh, the conference room in honor of Mayor Grimm. So this is before you again now. The, the issue has kind of, as uh, City Manager Mitchell mentioned, kind of been churning for uh, I think a few weeks here at least. And I think the, the biggest thing in my mind at least was that I did reach out to Mayor Grimm's wife uh, spoke to her and their daughter. I don't know if they have mo more than one daughter, but anyways, a daughter. And, uh, you know, kind of said, here's what's being considered. You know, how do you feel about that? Would you support this? And in the end, they were both very, very supportive of the city taking some steps. So uh, prior to doing that, uh, I think it would be appropriate at this time with this council, and now that, you know, former Mayor Grimm has passed, uh, for a motion giving direction if indeed that's what is wanted by council. So thank you. Thank you city clerk. Do we have a motion? I move that council approves renaming the boardroom to one to the Ted Grimm conference room in honor of the former mayor Ted Grimm. Second. Okay. Um, Councillor Dumanowski. Uh, through the chair, just brief uh, comments on this site was actually here when this was uh, brought forward back in 2001. I can't recall certainly what <laughs> what was discussed exactly. I do know this that um, at the time um, Ted Grimm was um, still with us, um, God rest his soul, and um, he was a very proud man, but a very humble man, and did not uh, wish to have uh, limelight and, and attention brought to him. He, he was a man of um, passion and commitment, and and a true public servant in every way, shape, and form. Um, I, I do note over those years, there were uh, other attempts to consider his name, uh, but he equally, as I understood it, was um, reluctant to have that. I, I do appreciate that his his wife, Ruth, and his daughter and, and family are, are um, willing to have even a small consideration like the boardroom 21 be named after him I think it's um, very appropriate. It it uh, will certainly it's a boardroom that's well used in this in this building, um, and um, he sat in, I'm sure, hundreds if not thousands of times over the years. So I think it's a, a small but an important um, step in recognizing his place holder in Medicine Hat's history as a long serving mayor, but also um, a dedicated public servant. So I'm wholeheartedly endorsing this. Thank you, Councillor Dumanowski. Is anybody interested in commenting or inquiring about this particular item? Mayor Clark? Thank you. Through the chair, in addition to Councillor Dumanowski's comments about um, you know, recognizing um, former Mayor Grimm's long service, um, I, I think it also is important. This, this issue was brought up um, by former city clerk uh, Larry Godden, as well as some other individuals who did note that council had um, uh, undertaken this decision uh, previously 
but because of the um, um, the humility of, of former Mayor Grimm, it was discussed and closed. And so I also appreciate that um, we were able to find the documents with the help, help of, of administration that, that contained those recommendations and uh, we're respecting the wishes of that former council. Thank you, Mayor Clark. Okay, I don't see another, I don't see further speaking uh, requests, so we will vote on the motion in front of us. That is unanimous. All right, 11-5 is an information request brought forward by Mayor Clark. Can I make a motion prior? I'm just noting the time where 20 minutes to 10. Mm -hmm. I understand that items 12.3, 12.4, and 12.5 are probably quite, need to be dealt with in a, in a timely way and there will be people watching with bated breath to determine whether or not they are receiving the things that they anticipated that they might receive. So I'm wondering if, oh sorry, I would like to make a motion to move item 12.3, 12.4 and 12.5 um, to be considered after 11.3, oh sorry, 11.4, which was the, the item we just dealt with. Yeah, go ahead. Through the chair, I agree. There is just one small thing. We've got like three members of the planning staff to do strong towns here too. So if we want to be mindful of time. And okay. Do we have a seconder? I'll, I'll second that. Looking at Mayor Clark, was there a motion? <laughs> yes. Oh, to, to move all of the items. Up. Up? 12.3, mm -hmm. 12.4. 12.3, Sports Wall of Fame recommendation. 12.4, 2024 Community Vibrancy Grant distribution. And 12.5, New Incentive Policy 0179 um, to be considered after item 11.4, renaming of boardroom 21, Ted Grimm con conference room. So now. Correct. Okay, Mayor Clark, I second that. I'm sorry the strong towns people we're still like we're working hard but yeah okay um any comments about that particular motion okay we will vote on the motion okay uh those items will be moved up so we will start uh the next uh, item, which is Sports Wall of Fame recommendation. Our sponsor is Public Service, so uh, Managing Director Stouth. Uh, we have a recommendation in front of us. Council approves both Joseph Henry Fisher and Sensei Zoroslav Greco uh, be inducted into the Medicine Hat Sports Wall of Fame for their contributions to the sports of hockey and karate, karate respectively. Uh, Managing Director Stouth, would you like to comment on this? Uh, thank you, Chairman, Chairperson Knodel. Uh, through the chair to council, uh, certainly two uh, worthy uh, nominees evaluated by the C uh, Community Vibrancy Advisory Board for their contribution to sports in our city. Um, both, uh, both extremely uh, worthy individuals in the areas that, uh, that they participated and led. And uh, I think I'll limit my comments to that and turn it... Uh, Back to Council. Thank you, Managing Director South. Councillor Robbins. Yeah, I just I'm I'm going to make the motion, but I just wanted to add that the um, applications were reviewed by the Community Vibrancy Board. They had a presentation and a package of materials related to it, and I believe it's in our materials, or it might have been in our last package. I'm not sure. Um, but in any event, there was uh, I see a member of the Community Vibrancy Board here who presented on these matters at Public Services. So I thought I would highlight their work on this uh, area, and I will make the motion. I will make the motion that Council approves both Joseph Henry Fisher and Sensei Zorislav Kirko to be inducted into the Medicine Hat Sports Wall of Fame for their contributions to the sports of hockey and karate, respectively. I'll second. Do we have any discussion? 
Okay, we will vote on the motion. That is unanimous. And now we will move on to 12-4, 2024 Community Vibrancy Grant Distribution. Our, our sponsor is again Public Services Committee. Um, we have a recommendation that council approves distribution of the 2024 Community Projects and Activities Grants as per the Community Vibrancy Advisory Board recommendations. Managing Director Stouth, would you like to comment? Thank you, Chairperson Knodel. Um, yes, and through the chair to council, uh, what you have before before you are the um, uh, first intakes of 2024 and the community vibrancy uh, grants. Uh, these were evaluated by the community vibrancy advisory board um, <clears throat> using the uh, council approved uh, rubric. And um, there was uh, certainly a number of, uh, of uh, grant applications and the uh, successful or the recommended successful grant uh, applicants are um, in your package. Thank you. Thank you, Managing Director Stouth. Um, I'm looking for a motion. I can make that motion on, as Perfect. again, Thank Community you. Vibrancy Board did the work and public services was able to ask questions about it. So I move that council approves the distribution of the 2024 Community Projects and Activities Grants as per the Community Vibrancy Advisory Board recommendations as presented. I'll second. Fantastic, do we have any discussion? Councillor Hirsch. Just uh, wanted to express my appreciation uh, to the Vibrancy Board in terms of making some of these decisions. Um, I think we, we are pretty lucky in this community that we have a multitude of events that happen in our community that I think we get a lot of pride from. Uh, the challenge is, is how do you div divide those dollars uh, in the most effective way. So uh, again, thank you. Uh, for those who uh, made applications and we're looking to forward to the next year or in the case some cases a couple of years in terms of the funding uh, but again I thank you from the vibrancy group thanks thank you Councillor Hirsch is there any additional comments questions okay with that we will vote on the rec or vote on the motion And that passes. Okay, so uh, twelve five is the new incentive new incentive policy zero one seven nine and amending tax incentive bylaw four six six seven. Our sponsors council committee of the whole, so we had the opportunity to discuss this um, on uh, our last council committee of the whole meeting. Um, we have a public hearing for bylaw 4667 and a recommendation that council considers first reading only of bylaw 4799 to amend the tax incentive bylaw. Uh, rescinds incentive policy 0170, a motion to approve will be needed. Approves incentive policy 0179 and finally approves the city center vibrancy incentive program and the infill and redevelopment housing incentive program pursuant to policy 0179. Um, so I'm looking for motions, please and thank you. I move that Council give first reading to bylaw 4799, a bylaw of the City of Medicine Hat to amend the tax incentive bylaw. I'll second. All right, and we will vote. And that is unanimous. And looking for a motion for rescinding. Oh, city manager, hello. Thank you, through the chair. Just before we go through the next vote at the Council Committee of the Whole on March 25th, Mayor Clark had a question about the previous Brownfield incentive bylaw and um, if, if it was who was signed it. It was signed internally by city solicitor, former city solicitor, and it did not need to come to council. So I just wanted to make sure that question got answered before we move forward. Thank you, city manager. All right, um, looking for the next motion. 
I move that council rescinds incentive policy 0170 and improve, approves incentive policy 0179. I'll second. Okay, uh, Mayor Clark. So is the intention just to give one reading to the incentive bylaw right now? Okay. Um, I, I, would, I was wondering what the brownfield, um, what, when it was paid out, but, and, and what the outcome of that was. Um, I don't recall seeing it in our, in our report back to council on the incentives, but I could be wrong. Um, uh, I had a question about, so the incentive providing 15,000 per dwelling unit to a maximum of 750,000 for new residential development on a single site and subject to the remaining funds available in this incentive program at the time of the application. I just wondered um, why I think it's, is it 50 dwelling units that that would cover? 15,000 times, what is the number of dwelling units that that covers? I think it's 50 per development. Go ahead. Hi, Mayor Clark. Um, through the chair. Um, I don't have that exact number with me. Is it 50? Okay, so 50 dwelling units altogether. And I was just wondering how that, like why 50 and not 100 or 25 or? Right. Through the chair, I'm going to um, get my colleague, uh, manager assistants to respond. So through the chair, so this program is specifically for the 2024 year. And there was only a certain amount of funds that remained from previous year programs. So perhaps a future iteration of that program could increase the upper level threshold. But for this one, we didn't want a single project to suck up all the grant funds. And then that was it. Um, so in a future proposal, if council wanted something like that, that we could uh, adjust the upper limits. The previous iteration of this program had a cap of 300,000, which uh, was about 20 units, and that um, wasn't successful. So we looked to incrementally increase that to 750 for this round. A future program could be much more than that, because a lot of the projects um, that we see, like if it's a larger uh, apartment block, could easily get above 50 units, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Uh, Councilor Robbins. Yes, thank you, and through the chair, I just wanted to thank you both. I was not able to attend the March 25th meeting. I was ironically on that side of the table in another city council doing a day job um, presentation, so. I uh, was much more relaxing on this side. I would have said, but watching it on TV was super relaxing compared to being here. So I just wanted to thank you both because in watching it, I understood everything you were saying and proposing you answered questions. Thank you very much to my colleagues for asking all the questions I might have had. Um, but I just want to let you know that I had reviewed your presentation um, and I was very grateful that it was online so I could do so and it was an open meeting, even better I could do so, and so could others who might be interested. So thank you very much for both of your presentations that day. Thank you, Councillor Robbins. Mayor Clark? Sorry. Um, the other thing I noted during the, oh, through, through the chair, the other thing that I noted during our Committee of the Whole meeting was that administrative committee should be um, ensuring all incentive staff provide and applicants provide a written attestation of impartiality to the manager uh, and administrative committee period, rather than just making it specific to the incentive award, because developing the incentive is, should the person developing this, the incentive should not have an interest in 
like a specific interest, in, a pecuniary interest in the properties that could receive the incentive. For example, if I lived on the hill um, and I developed a, an incentive program that would specifically, if I applied for it, confer benefit onto me, um, that would be a pecuniary interest in my view. Thank you, Mayor Clark. So at this point, uh, we need to vote on this particular motion. Okay. Go ahead. May yep. I? Uh, Councillor Canodal. Yes. Um, I would like to make a motion to, uh, in on page 330 of the council package and under the policy role of administration, administrative committee one, administrative committee D, to remove prior to having any involvement with an incentive award. Do we have a seconder? Um, I'll second. I just wondered if it was in the definitions as well. I'm just looking at that. I thought it was. The, through the chair, the um, incentive staff piece, the definition does include um, all aspects in like the development and, and analysis, approving, monitoring, evaluation, administration, or delivery of an incentive. So there'd be a bigger connection between the two parts if the definition matched the incentive. Okay. I'll second that. Do we have any discussion? Yes, City Clerk. Thank you. Through the Chair, could, I, I'm sorry, could we just review that again for the record? We need to ensure we make appropriate uh, amendments if this passes. And, and I, I don't think the Recording Secretary nor myself have that exactly. So we're on page 30 of the Council packet, right? Page 3 of 6 of the policy. Is that Mayor correct? Clark, would you like to repeat your motion? Yes, page three of six of the policy under role of administrative committee, 1D, amend 1D to remove prior to having any involvement with an incentive award. Thank you very much. That helps, yeah, greatly. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Clark. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. If I'll just, prior to having, or you're probably just copying it. And it's D. Oh. Page three of six. One D. And then just, um, sorry. And then quotes in front of prior, yet yeah, there, thank you. Okay, Councillor Hirsch, go ahead. Can, can I just ask a clarifying question that I'm just thinking about? So staff member creates policy, forwards it for review with many eyes on it, ratifies it, council approves it, and it's now a policy. But the comment was that, that if, if that person in the future applies, so, so think of any development in any part of the town, and if that person happens to be part of that, then that individual can't apply for this incentive program. I struggle with that when 
we have even groups that apply and make decisions on cost to ride a bus and that sort of thing. And if it's reduced or if it's increased or whatever, like I, I'm trying to, with that many eyes on it that approves it, I'm trying to understand how that would be a pecuniary interest when, quite frankly, it went through the whole um, process to ensure compliance and that sort of thing. I'm just, help me understand that, I guess. Through the chair, uh, the section just requires that those staff provide a written attestation of impartiality to their manager and administrative committee. And I appreciate that. I think, am I getting it wrong that because you had mentioned a pecuniary interest or a financial, is it the case then that a staff member who would maybe be part of this creates it, comes to council, everything's done, is that preclude that person that happened to live in that neighborhood, the inability to apply for the, the award? Is that what you're getting at? I'm just trying to understand, that's all. So we're in this policy delegating some of the authority to create and amend incentives. So it wouldn't, the incentive itself wouldn't necessarily come to council. My, I am not suggesting that in no case an individual who helped develop an incentive could apply for it, just that they would have to have a written attestation of impartiality. So for example, if it was three houses that the incentive was for and mine was one of them versus it applies universally across the city, that would be a different calculation. But that, that's the role of administrative committee. So I appreciate that, but I'm just, I'm reading the removal of prior to having any involvement with incentive award is, is almost the kind of what you're, you're getting at and we're removing it. I, it's, it, I mean, I'm, I can support it. It's not a problem. I just needed to understand, that's all. Thanks. Councilor Hirsch, did you have your question answered? Um, seeing no further speakers, we, just making sure you're not motioning to me. Okay, go ahead, do it. No? Okay. Uh, Councillor Robbins. I am, sorry, I okay. just dived, <laughs> diving on in. Um, I think that the, if you look at the section role of incentive staff, that really does help define, so if there's a written attestation done, I understand what Mayor Clark saying, it's not just about administering the program, but also building the program. And so it does have, um, you do the written attestation and then goes on to say if it disclose a potential conflict of interest, then it goes on to be considered. So that would, would never preclude a staff member from being able to use um, one of the incentives. It just would make sure there's a check and balance that they didn't build something only they benefited from. But there's lots of checks and balances along the way. I just think that it's removal of that sort of matches better with the definition section. Okay, seeing no further speakers, we will vote on this uh, pro pro proposed amendment. Um, yes. Okay, that passes. Um, with that, uh, we still need to vote on uh, bullet point two here, that council rescinds incentive policy 0170. So we will, yes, so, but we would do those separately, correct? They've got them as, as one here. You can do it either way. Okay, okay. Um, so can someone remind me if this has been stated? Has somebody moved? Who is my first and seconder? Okay, sounds good. Um, is there any further discussion on this item? Okay, we will vote. And that passes. Um, we have a final motion that I'm looking for here. 
I move that council approves the city center vibrancy incentive program and the infill and redevelopment housing incentive program pursuant to policy 0179. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, any discussion on this topic? Nothing, okay, we will vote. And that is unanimous. Okay, um, we will return to, now, um, can I clarify whether our revision, would, would we return now to the information request by Mayor Clark or do the strong towns? We do, we would go in order, right? Strong towns, that wasn't part of our revision. It would be the um, request yeah. unless someone makes a motion for- To reorganize. To reorganize. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll make the motion to reorganize the strong towns. People have been waiting for a bit. Yep. And they do have a presentation. Mm -hmm. Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Okay, we will vote. Okay, that passes. Uh, welcome back. <laughs> so uh, our, let's just see here. We're, we have reorganized, so uh, bear with me for a second. Do, do, do. What number are we here? What number are we at? 12.1. 12.1. Thank you. I appreciate your support. Okay. So this is 12.1 uh, under committee business. We have uh, uh, taking the Strong Towns approach in Medicine Hat. Our sponsor is De Development and Infrastructure Committee. We have uh, Sean Champagne, uh, Senior Planner, here to provide a presentation to us. And I will turn the uh, torch over to you. Wonderful. Uh, so thank you everyone. Thanks for having me here this evening. I'm very happy to be here to provide this update to you. Uh, just as a short summary of my presentation tonight, uh, what I want to do is provide first a quick little concise summary of some aspects of the Strong Towns approach. I want to share three examples of how we implemented that uh, throughout this year. I'm going to outline three of the sessions that took place at the last uh, in-person event that took place here at the Esplanade in November of 2023, and also share three outcomes from that, uh, those presentations, provide a little sneak peek of some things that we're working on uh, in the near future, and wrap up with a great conclusion to our first year just showcasing how successful we've been throughout this program. So I'll jump right into it. Um, it's really difficult to summarize a book and a, a website and an academy in just a few points. If I needed to do so, as I will here, uh, I would do it in this way. So uh, Strong Towns essentially establishes that the way we've been growing as a city, uh, and these are all North American cities throughout North America, is fiscally unsustainable. Essentially meaning that our liabilities, like our infrastructure liabilities, are exceeding the revenues that we can generate. Uh, they tend to favor small bets, so pilot projects, for example, uh, continual refinement over large capital-intensive projects. And they place an emphasis on uh, providing services to our residents in a way that they're actually being used. So putting our residents first, putting people first. So I wanna share three examples of ways that this uh, Strong Towns approach has been put into action. Um, before I even begin, I wanna make very clear that these aren't things that Strong Towns came in and told us, uh, you have problem A, so you should implement uh, solution A, and here's problem B. These are all solutions that have come from city staff uh, who have participated in these projects or in this uh, community action lab. So they've learned things and they found ways to implement this work uh, in their day-to-day. -day. So a first is a really great example that really touches on the effect on our bottom line. Um, and this is work that was done by an, our environmental utilities department. So they're undergoing multiple sewer and water main rehabilitation projects. And a lot of these save us a lot of money. So the first is using some innovative design choices. They uh, completely abandoned an entire section of sewer lineup in Crescent Heights, uh, about 1.2 kilometers of that. Uh, these cost approximately $15 a year per meter to maintain. So this represents a savings of over $20,000 a year, every single year in perpetuity. 
Uh, the second example is actually pretty mind-boggling. Uh, so also by our EU department, they've repurposed 130 meters of high pressure water supply line that was uh, feeding fire hydrants downtown, and they're repurposing them to serve businesses downtown rather than installing a new line. So at a cost of about $8,500 uh, linear meter for a brand new line, this represents a savings of over a million dollars. So just some of this innovative thinking has a real big effect on our bottom line. And this uh, comes from a, a team, uh, Sandra Plank, the manager at Environmental Utilities, is one of our most keen members of the Strong Towns Action Team. So her and her team did some great work here. Uh, in terms of small bets, um, small bets and continual refinement. So we found out in 2023 that the fall trade show that's uh, generally hosted by the uh, 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 Chamber of Commerce, there we go, thank you, uh, was cancelled. And we have a lot of municipal projects that are in the works, so we couldn't just not engage the public. All of these require a lot of engagement. So um, it wouldn't be effective for all of these different departments to organize their own independent uh, public engagement sessions. So in partnership with our corporate communications department, they organized the very first city-led open house that took place in November 2023. Uh, right here in City Hall, so seven separate booths. It took place over four hours right here in City Hall. They did some marketing on Facebook. We printed some sandwich boards in-house and placed them outside to kind of promote the event, um, all at a cost of some pool house coffee, uh, some snacks, and that was pretty much it. So they've now organized and hosted a second event that took place in a larger venue at the Esplanade, um, more topics being presented, more and more people showing up, and we're starting to see a lot of the same familiar faces coming back to find out, well, what's going on next? And they can talk to several uh, city staff members and find out about multiple city projects. So that was 2.0. I'm really looking forward to seeing what they come up with next. What's going to be the next open house 3.0? Again, just continuously refining. This next uh, example here is fascinating as well. So this was a partnership with our Parks and Recreation Department and the school board. Um, so a resident who's also a member of the uh, public school board approached Parks and Recreation with an idea uh, to establish some intentional programming in our parks. So she noticed we have no shortage of park space, lots of them with playground equipment and lots of great equipment, but very often underutilized. So her suggestion was this free play program hosted in parks throughout the city. So this intentional programming that brings residents together. Uh, it takes about 30 minutes to set up their equipment, 30 minutes to take down, and they only needed about $3,000 to buy all of the equipment and a little bit of help along the way. Uh, I encourage everyone to check out the Medicine Hat Free Play uh, Facebook page. They have hundreds of photos, just like this one here, of families, children, their parents, grandparents, all participating in this. Um, and the best part is we didn't have to spend a whole bunch of money on something, more equipment that's just going to further increase our infrastructure debt liabilities. So Strong Towns wrote a very uh, great article on this initiative and I just shared a screenshot with that, uh, of that on, on the screen here in my presentation. I encourage everyone to go uh, read that article because it's, it's fascinating. Next, uh, I want to share some highlights from the third and final um, it's, yeah. yeah. There we go. You're good. Rondi looks oh, good. Rondi got you. Oh my goodness. Spoilers. Okay. So I want to share some highlights from the last uh, uh, Community Action Lab public presentation that took place uh, here in Medicine Hat. 
back in November. Uh, so the first was a public presentation called Escaping the Housing Trap. So this public uh, presentation is available on YouTube for anyone who wasn't able to attend, they can watch the presentation. So in this presentation, Chuck Marone, the founder and president of Strong Towns, uh, shared a little bit of a history of the housing, uh, housing in North America. So he talks about the Great Depression, fast growth, subprime loans, the housing bubbles, things of that nature. And the entire second half of his presentation addresses the following two questions. How do we make housing more affordable in our community? And how do we create more uh, uh, affordable housing in our community? And those aren't the same question. So his position uh, that he shared is that we're quite powerless in trying to um, resolve the first question. So these are challenges that are controlled by forces that are outside of municipal government's control. So we're talking about things like rising interest rates, uh, increased cost of living, decisions being made by central banks, but he outlined some of the potential solutions to addressing that second question. So uh, he introduced some, some concepts such as allowing the next increment of growth by right. So this is the concept from his book that no neighborhood should experience radical change, but no neighborhood should be exempt from change. So just a very timely topic given some of the, the conversations that took place today. Uh, lowering the bar of entry into the development game. So this is how can we accommodate things like accessory apartments, backyard suites, starter homes, things of that nature. How can we fix finance for small development? So again, very timely. How can we provide incentives that render smaller developments profitable? Uh, talked about this concept of pre-approved plans, which I'll address a little bit further uh, along in my presentation, and evaluating value per hectare when we're reviewing development and rezoning proposals. And again, we've seen many examples of that uh, taking place tonight when we're sharing um, updates on in terms of things like rezonings and uh, development proposals. And if some of these uh, items sound familiar, Many of them formed part of the initiatives that we developed as part of our application to the Federal Housing Accelerator Fund grant. Um, so I won't dive into those specific details right now. I will a little bit later, but I will say this. In terms of the initiatives that we included uh, within this grant application, we took the Strong Towns approach when we were developing those, grant, or those initiatives. So that means two things. Uh, these initiatives don't result in further infrastructure debt liabilities for us as a city. And secondly, many of them, if not all of them, can be implemented whether we receive the grant or not. So that just renders us as a city a lot more resilient. Um, we're not relying on these funds and it's a make or break deal. Many of these things we can pursue regardless. So a second uh, workshop that took place at the public event was this city staff workshop. Uh, we structured this workshop much like our action team meeting. So all city staff were given an opportunity to tackle a real struggle in our community using the Strong Towns approach. So again, the Strong Towns approach is what, we've, uh, what I've outlined here. So this is this concept of humbly observing where people in our community struggle, asking the question, what is the next smallest thing we can do right now to address that struggle? Do that thing right now and then repeat. Uh, each table, all the conversations were happening pretty organically. People would just bring up, to, bring up for conversation a struggle that they face in the city and they address things like energy consumption, unsightly properties, employee attractions, things of that nature. But one that really stood out to me uh, was our downtown and uh, this uh, perception of a lack of parking. Um, so a solution was proposed by one of our very own uh, planners in our planning department, Sandra Moses, uh, who recently moved to Medicine Hat, and she did have trouble finding parking in our downtown. And it's not because it wasn't there, it's just she didn't know how to find it. Um, so the solution that they came up with at their table was this, as simple as it appears, why don't we list public parking on Google Maps? And so it's now there, it's live. And it seems very simple, it can seem very trivial. No one did this before. No one took the initiative to actually put that on there. So we did that in partnership again, using our corporate Google account uh, with uh, corporate communications to do that. And following the last time I gave this presentation, we actually have again a 2.0. 
So corporate communications uh, noticed the work that we did on this and said, how can we take this a step further? And they've worked on developing this, and it's a handout that they will be able to give to uh, downtown local business owners. This is information that they can put up in their window. This is something that they can share with their clients, they can share with their staff, just so it's very clear all of the parking that's available in our downtown. And so that's great. I, I love things like that. Uh, next, the, the final session that took place at that public presentation was this transportation workshop. So this session was added because of the city's work on our transportation master plan. Uh, it was an introduction to the topics that are introduced in Chuck's second book. So this book is called Confessions of a Recovering Engineer, Transportation for a Strong Town. And this is a follow-up to the first Strong Towns book. And by the way, these are both available at the Medicine Hat Public Library if anyone is interested in reading these, um, I implore you to go take out a copy. Very interesting stuff. Um, so he introduced certain topics such as what is the difference between a street and a road? Those aren't the same things. And he introduces this concept of a strode. If you want to find out what that is, you should read the book. Um, and it starts talking about and introducing uh, concepts of what makes a great street and who is the person in our community who is best suited to lead a street design team? And it's probably not who you think. So again, read the book, really interesting. <laughs> so uh, what was the outcome of that? Um, so Strong Towns graciously donated to us 15 copies of this book, and we had 15 people attend this transportation session. And these are uh, members of our transit department, municipal works, parks and recreation, environmental utilities, planners. Rather than just giving them the book, we said, if I give you a copy of this book, would you join a book club if I start a book club? And I've never done that before, and they all agreed. So we all agreed to read a chapter a week, and we'd meet once a month, and we would talk about the, what we learned. And we met over three sessions, and these are all people that are involved in the transportation uh, master plan. And not only uh, just city employees, but also some of the consultants that are working on this uh, jumped at the opportunity. So the outcome of this is um, city staff and external consultants meeting and talking about concepts that are maybe different from ways that we've uh, conducted business in the past and just talking about what are the pros, what are the cons, what can work here, what doesn't work here. It's just great because it's a different frame of mind, a way of looking at things through a different lens. So I love seeing these things implemented in this uh, Hatters in Motion plan that's being led by our Municipal Works Department. So what's next? Um, so I wanna share some things that we're working on in planning and development services that kind of take the Strong Towns approach. So first are some of these initiatives from the Housing Accelerator Fund. So we've uh, shared the nine initiatives listed on the right, but I wanna highlight two of them. So first is number three. Uh, so this is implementing a strategy through zoning, through our land use bylaw, that allows for sensitive intensification. Uh, so what we've done here is uh, we're proposing, and again, this was uh, shared at the open house, um, a, la uh, a refresh to our land use bylaw, an amendment to our land use bylaw that would create four different uh, residential districts rather than just two that we have today. So again, this allows us to just in more incrementally grow and have a little bit more certainty about what can be developed next door. And if this sounds familiar, Chuck talked about this as well in his presentation when he talks about allowing the next increment of growth by right. Next is number five. So uh, reducing permit uh, costs and timings for pre, uh, with pre-approved designs for missing middle housing. So we want to eventually have a, a catalog of backyard suites and duplexes and row houses these permits that we can issue immediately because we've pre-approved them. Uh, this is a huge undertaking. So again, using the Strong Towns approach, we're breaking this down into smaller bets that we can implement and refine. So we're in the process of drafting a set of pre-approved garage permits. 
Um, it's not going to do anything to uh, address housing in our community, and it's not going to greatly and drastically increase the amount of tax revenue that we can generate, but it allows us as a department to test our procedures, to see how does this work when we receive or create a pre-approved plan and receive that application, can we put that through our system? So when the day comes and we do eventually have this catalog of pre-approved plans for row housing, for example, we know that we can implement it quickly and easily. And finally, uh, we're conducting fiscal analysis when we're undertaking our development reviews. And again, very timely, we've uh, talked about that a few times tonight. Uh, here on the right is a screenshot from an article that was written uh, by Strong Towns on how much more financially productive historic areas of our uh, cities can often be. And if these look familiar, that's because that's sugar daddy cheesecake on the bottom. So again, this is a really interesting article that's using some local examples here in Medicine Hat. So what's next? Um, well, ultimately that's up to everyone to decide. Uh, we've all participated in this Strong Towns Community Action Lab in one way or another. We've read the book, we've followed the lessons through the Strong Towns Academy, or we just shared some of the articles that we read online. There are principles within this book and within everything that we've learned that everyone can implement in their day-to-day -day lives. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what are some of the other things uh, our other uh, my colleagues at the city will come up with, or council, or residents. Uh, we have a very strong local conversation group that have taken to heart many of these principles, and they do, they do excellent work. So I'm really looking forward to, to seeing the things that they work on. So um, finally, I promised a thrilling a conclusion. We won't take the time to watch that video, but I think we all saw the video on our YouTube uh, channel, uh, Strong Towns Thinking. This was part of the Mayor's State of the City Address. Again, uh, I shared a little bit of a summary of the Strong Towns approach, and uh, we shared some examples of ways that we've implemented that. So after we created that video, I forwarded that onto Strong Towns just for their information and say, hey, we created this thing. It's a little bit of a, a summary of the things that we've done. And this here is the reply that I received from Strong Towns. So they said, we are blown away and humbled by the work that everyone at the city is undertaking. This represents a city that is no longer satisfied with the status quo. Medicine Hat is showing that our cities can pursue a much different path. You're an inspiration to so many cities that are also ready to shift the broader conversation about growth, development, and public investment. That comes from Edward Erfurt. He's the Director of Community Action at Strong Towns. And so what I've done here is I've crossed out Strong Towns from this approach because for anyone who's participated in this program with us, this has now become the Medicine Hat approach. This is just the way that we conduct business now uh, by looking through a lens like this. Um, here's a screenshot uh, of the Strong Towns webpage for the Community Action Lab. Um, they have a very, very competent <coughs> video producer that creates very excellent content. This is the website they use to entice other municipalities to join the next iteration of the Community Action Lab. Rather than them producing their own video to include on this website, they're using our very own uh, video, using us as an example of, hey, this is how successful you can be. This is what you can implement in your municipality if you participate in this program with us. So there's really nothing else that I can say to, to explain how successful we've been while working through this program than this here. We're literally the shining example of what you can become. So thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, um, provide any clarity to anything that I've shared. Thank you so much, Sean. It's, uh, I, I think the thing that comes to mind is how grateful I am that you're the advocate in the face of this program because you bring a, a great deal of energy and um, excitement and support and you put a ton of time into it too. So thank you for being the glue so that others can kind of feed off the positive work that you're doing. It's been great. So, um, Mayor Clark and then Councillor Robbins. Thank you, and through the chair, I, I also appreciate the, the work and, and the presentation. Um, in, incremental or small bets is certainly something that, you know, and, and bottom-up community-led initiatives that are supported by the city is, are certainly two things that, that appeal to me. One of the things that 
I was hoping to get out of this process, and I, I believe we were told we would get out of the process, is um, a calculation of our long-term infrastructure liabilities. And that has yet to come forward, and I'm just uh, wondering, um, perhaps through the chair to City Manager Mitchell, when we can expect to receive that. City Manager Mitchell. Thank you, through the chair. I will turn it over to Managing Director Bohan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we're working on a, a citywide asset management program. As, as you all know, we did pr produce a uh, uh, presentation last fall, uh, which illustrated how much uh, we've got uh, in terms of the value of our assets and how we go about uh, managing, maintaining them, adding to them, and uh, moving forward. Uh, right now, there's an initiative underway to establish an enterprise-wide asset management reporting structure. So that's still forthcoming uh, through uh, uh, corporate services. So we expect something. Uh, I, I don't have a date for that uh, completion, um, although it's something that's actively in progress. Uh, I can assure you, when it comes to infrastructure, uh, we are uh, we continually uh, monitor and maintain and manage that. Uh, if, with your permission, I'll ask uh, uh, potentially uh, City Manager Mitchell to uh, uh, request a, a comment from Managing Director Eager. Uh, through the chair. So, as part of corporate services, now we we've uh, added a mandate on uh, corporate asset management. Um, and through the chair, uh, we will be. Um, we are we, we have a, a, a policy uh, that is completed. Um, it's working through administrative committee, and uh, hope to soon be at uh, corporate service at the next corporate services committee. So, uh, stay tuned. You'll you'll have an outline there as to the the framework um, that we're uh, following and the timeline related to that, which is a multi-year uh, timeline to implement that framework. So. I, I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, some great progress there on how we view assets and and what is our risk profile related to that. Thank you, Managing Director Eager and uh, City Manager. Thank you, through the chair. And it's really uh, obviously timely that we are doing asset management because having the data and it'll help council and administration make defensible decisions and know our long-term strategy and our long-term costs. So it isn't that we're not trying to get this done, we're just trying to do it in a proper manner. And having been involved in a few municipalities, start to the finish asset management is living, breathing document, and it does take time, but once it is, we will be able to determine the risk factors and all the mitigation so that when we bring information to council, it's very factual and data-driven. Thank you. Thank you, City Manager. It sounds like um, the policy and the framework that is in uh, process will allow you to have up-to-date data rather than just um, data in hindsight. So uh, just to confirm, uh, the council or our uh, corporate services committee will have a policy come forward and we'll have more information about timeline at that meeting. Admin, then corporate services. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Councillor Robbins. Yeah, thank you, Andrew, the chair. I just um, wanted to ask a question about the two questions. Land use bylaw refresh. I found it really interesting in the context of the three um, public hearings we had today and to know there'll be more options on the, t on the menu will be lovely. Um, I'm just wondering if there's a sense of timeline of the land use bylaw refresh. It's, I, I've stumped you, it's late, it's 10.30. Um, John knows the answer. Okay, great. Uh, through the Chair to all of Council. The land use bylaw is, is underway. We've, uh, we've substantially completed numerous sections and we're compiling and reviewing them at this time. The intention is to have that uh, pulled all together by mid-year and to Council into the approval process at some point in the fall. I don't have exact timelines, but we are working on it. It will be complete this year. Okay, great, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you for the update. I have a second, yeah. a second Go question. <clears throat> Just about the pre-approved plan. So you're starting with garage builds. 
Um, is there, what, what is the timeline of that sort of pilot, I'm gonna call it a pilot project, maybe you're not calling it that, but what's the timeline of that until it could, you think it could expand or at least analyze whether it should expand? So through the chair, um, we have drafted, uh, we have created a first draft of the pre-approved plan. Uh, we're at the stage now of knowing how we can implement that within our, uh, within our systems right now. So I don't have an exact date of when it would be uh, implemented. We have a, a framework and outlines example, uh, garage sizes, for example, uh, of what could be approved, what are the different uh, changes, how, how much, um, um, how much someone could customize it, for example. Uh, we're, we're in very early stages of that right now. Okay. Can I ask one more? Yeah, of course, go ahead. Um, and this, this might be a bit of a cheeky question, but in your book club, when you were reviewing the books and reviewing the chapters, did you have moments, or, did you, or not very many moments, I'm, that's why I'm asking, where um, the people who had reviewed the book said, These, this is a great idea, but this will never work in Medicine Hat, or, or this would work, or if it, it, another way. Were there things in the books that you just rejected saying these are never going to work, which then forms your Medicine Hat approach? Of course. Uh, so through the chair, when we're reading these documents here, um, they're not so much prescriptive as sparking ideas and sparking discussion. So of course, there are things within both books they're written in a different context as well as our own um, that simply, they don't fit here. Uh, so there are always examples in both of these books of things that we need to tweak to meet the local context. Great, thank you so much. Councillor Hirsch. Yeah, the timing's kind of impeccable in regards to, to having this conversation with the land applications that came about and, and some of the other stuff we talked about tonight. I'm interested, and we've, we've seen it at a national scale, talking about housing. We know it's, uh, in fact, we've heard already the discussion in terms of, of not a lot of listings in Medicine Hat, that there's a need for the housing. But I'm, I'm challenged when tonight, for example, there was uh, observations made in terms of perhaps we're intensifying um, inappropriately. So I think you, you looked at the, I was just, I'm looking for your observation and your, maybe your feedback in some of the comments that were made this evening, including maybe leaving some of the land as it sits um, for maybe not development. Um, and which is, a, I go back to your, your commentary on page 284 the packet where it talks about number one energized hubs um, looking at mixed use and higher density developments um, within the within the um, urban villages and then not item number six which is new life for old spaces establish land acquisition and de-risking strategy to promote intensification of underutilized sites which across the street from the remand center we had that discussion this evening is I'm, I'm, strugg I'm, I'm struggling with the fact that I do believe that we do have an opportunity in terms of intensification, but, but yet the feedback from the community when you're next door to that development arrives. And I guess I'm just struggling with, with that because it's certainly not, um, you know, the, the the, the, the rationale is the fact that, that, Sean, you talk about it all the time, is that we don't need the growth. It's just about how do we look at it from what we have within within the brownfield. So I'm just, I just want, just would love your, your feedback in terms of some of the struggles what we're, we're dealing with right now. Of course, yeah. So through the chair, um, what I would refer to first and foremost is probably our municipal development plan. So a lot of the concepts that are in this book are not entirely foreign to the ways that we are already conducting business today. So in our municipal development plan, we identify certain areas of the city that are likely more ripe for more infill development, which areas of our city are likely more appropriate for infill development. So the answer in the MDP are generally areas where there is already municipal infrastructure in place municipal services in place, so we're talking about uh, along more major roads, where there's transit service, for example, where there are opportunities for commercial, 
quick access uh, to roads and highways and things of that nature. Um, so I'd say that's how we make the decision on where is most appropriate for growth. And I think through some of the amendments that we're proposing through this new land use bylaw and allowing that growth to happen a little bit more incrementally will be a positive shift. Uh, so hopefully not experiencing the same types of uh, uh, pushback that we have in the past. Just creates a little bit more certainty for residents, for developers. Yeah. Good to go. Okay. Uh, Councillor Sharps. Thank you, and through the chair. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, as the chair of director of development and infrastructure, I have been bugging Pat to get you down here so we could have a more fulsome conversation. So even though council had made a decision to uh, forge ahead, I think the very first time I had a conversation about strong towns uh, was at a downtown collective meeting. And I think it was probably absolutely painful for you. So I'm gonna apologize for that first. So, and I was probably the most painful person. So, and I, I acknowledge that completely and utterly. Um, and I still probably am gonna be a little bit. I've never made any bones about it to you. I, I have reservations, I like some of it. Other things kind of scare me a little bit and I'm, uh, and I'm, I'm just gonna you know, call the elephant in the room because I think one of the biggest things that I always got, Sean, as soon as you hit strong towns, all this 15 minute cities comes up. And I lose the will to live when I hear that because I don't want to live in a 15 minute. I love being on the edge of town. I love being able to walk my dogs in nowhere and not see another human. I really do love that. Um, so, but I also respect that lots of people don't want that, right? They want to be downtown. They want to ride their bike. They want to see lots of people. And I think that's what makes a community is all the differences. So how do we address, because I do hear that in the community, is this 15 minute towns? And I don't think it is. And I think I was misled by that, but tell me, I would rather hear it from you. What is it? What are we looking at? Absolutely. Um, I'd be happy to address that question. So I invite everyone to visit. Uh, we have a very comprehensive Shape Your City page on the topic of strong towns. And on there, we have an FAQ. This question came up so frequently okay. that I put it number one right at the top. Okay. Is this 15 minute cities? And it's not. Um, in many ways, Medicine Hat, a 15 minute city is simply a, a city where you can reach all of the amenities that you use day in and day out within a 15 minute walk or bike ride of where you live. I've just described most areas of Medicine Hat. So we're already there. That's not what this is. Okay. Um, this is more about being fiscally conservative with the way we grow. So we can do anything that we'd like. We just need to make sure that we can afford the decisions that we're making. It comes down to that, essentially. No, and I, I do appreciate that. I mean, I would like to retire here. So, I mean, ultimately, if we don't get our expenses under control, I don't see that happening, obviously. Um, but it's not a this council issue. It's a, just the way we do things, and it's been leading up to this. It's just the way the world is. So how do we, um, oh, I had a quick question about uh, the pre-plans. Is that like the Sears catalog of like garages? Through the chair, yeah. For okay. Yes, it's, okay. it's essentially that. It would be a catalog of uh, uh, proposed developments so okay. row houses, backyard suites that someone could flip through and say, I want this. Okay. They could come back that afternoon to pick it up, pick up the permit. Wow, that sounds very awesome and less painful than what we're hearing now, right? So I think I appreciate if we're moving in that um, direction. Um, one of the other things that really caught my mind about what you said was no neighborhood should radically change. How often when we're looking at these land use developments are we putting that sentence in the forefront? Like, so is it just a thought or is it a living, breathing, that is our philosophy. So through the chair, um, that is absolutely our philosophy. Uh, that's kind of the nature of our work as uh, urban planners is weighing the pros and cons of different development. Uh, radical change is also something that's open to a lot of interpretation. Radical change for one person may not be radical change for another. Um, so in our profession, we do a real balancing act where uh, we have to balance the wants and needs of immediate neighbors, 
broader city, um, what our uh, infrastructure can accommodate, uh, what we have for electrical capacity, for example, road capacity. So we're balancing so many different things at once, but we do absolutely take into account that we need to make sure that the growth that we accommodate uh, does fit well and is sensitive to the area where it's being proposed. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. A uh, Couple more questions, sorry, Chair, is that okay? Thank you. Um, so for the people that are struggling with this concept, what's the best way to get a hold of somebody and talk to somebody and get some real live answers? Because I think what I hear most in the community is that they aren't feeling heard. And it's not just on this issue, it's on every issue. It's like everything we talked about today, they don't feel heard. And I think there's a huge difference between being agreed with and being heard. And I commit to hearing, not agreeing to everything. So, but I do find that I don't know if there is a way, um, and maybe I'm just dumb and I, I'll take that, but I couldn't find a way to reach out and ask a question on Strong Towns to somebody like you. And I, how do we do that? Uh, so specifically on the topic of uh, yeah, strong towns yeah. or uh, so development in general? So the lovely lady at the top there has concerns, and I know she does, but how do we address that? Like, I don't want people feeling ignored. I don't want to be ignored, so why would they? But I'm not saying we're going to agree with the answers mm -hmm. we get, but we should be able to... Because when you came to the downtown collective, after you left, I had a bit of a different attitude. I'm still a little opposed to some things, but it's because I get it in my mind that I, it's a 15-minute town still, right? Even though you've told me a hundred times it's not. So how do people get to have this conversation? Because that was helpful for me. Um, sure, absolutely. So through the chair, um, throughout the year, there were very, very many opportunities for the public to participate in the community action lab in a whole host of ways. So uh, I arranged to have our public library um, get a copy of this book and they took that a step uh, forward and they actually bought I think 10 copies of it and they actually created a book club kit. So there were residents in the city that took a whole uh, bag of 10 of these and created a, a Strong Towns book club. So there was that. We hosted many uh, public events, three public events, uh, each with several workshops, many of which were open to the public. So people could attend the public presentations or they could participate in some of these discussions. We held them at the Esplanade. We held them at uh, the library. Uh, there's even ways that residents themselves could participate in this, like the example I shared earlier about our local conversation group. So, um, Although this is an initiative that's being led by the city, for lack of a better term, uh, these are principles that people can implement on their own, so with a, uh, some other residents. But um, that being said, on that Shape Your City page, I, I'm essentially an open book. I share everything in there through the FAQ. Okay. I have sort of a Strong Towns Journey page that uh, provides an account of everything that we've undertaken throughout this year. and. Uh, Unless I'm mistaken, I think my name and email address is on there. So um, anyone could reach out to me anytime Excellent. to discuss this. Okay, and good job on the free play. That was fantastic. So. Uh, through, through the chair, I'd like to address uh, Councillor Sharp's uh, question with a bit more information. I'd just like to provide some context. Strong Towns is very much an awareness and information piece for Mayor and Council and for the residents of uh, Medicine Hat. We just spoke about the asset management program. We spoke about uh, the assets the municipality has and we are a service provider. We provide public services for private property and we collect taxation off that private property. So Strong Towns talks about being fiscally responsible. And this is very, very foundational to informing your policy development. Now, our MDP is, is a standard piece of legislation that is adopted by council that aligns with the Municipal Government Act that is similar to other pieces of legislation across almost every Western democracy. This is how we shape our town. And when we present reports to you, we look at that policy, we look at your strategic plan as well, and we align with your intentions. And so when we adopt a municipal development plan, we are articulating what the public interest is and we work with council, we work with the community through engagement to create that. What Strong Towns is, is it's an information piece where we are saying that there are ways of looking at development that is more efficient and more beneficial to the functioning of this municipality long term. 
we are not suggesting that we, uh, we go in any particular direction. We are saying that we have to be aware that if we don't have efficient infrastructure, if we don't have an efficient way to, uh, to run this municipality, it's going to cost us and future generations more money long term. And there are ways we can make our, our cities more livable. There are ways we can make our cities uh, more attractive. We can make our cities more, more appealing to new residents and people who want to relocate their businesses here. Strong talents is a very powerful information piece. And I'd like it to, to put it in that context. It's not, it's not telling you what we should be doing. It's saying that we should be aware of these particular aspects when we are planning and using them to have the best and most fabulous place imaginable. So just a bit of background information. It's not intended to tell you what to do. It's intended to tell you what the consequences of certain actions are and with that to inform our decision making in a more fulsome manner. So I just wanted to add that to the, uh, to the conversation. Okay, so no further speakers are on my list. So um, you're not looking for anything from us tonight. You're, this is just for information. Um, so uh, we will say thank you and appreciate the work that you've done so far and your presentation tonight to update us on, on where you're at. So thanks so much, Sean. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. All right. So 12.3 is the sports. Oh, just kidding. Uh, ignore me. It's 10.50. Hoy. Okay. 11. Oh, we're going back. Got it. Okay. So we're going back in time to 11.5. We have an information request brought forward by Mayor Clark. So uh, if you'd like to give us an update as to your purpose, and we'll go from there. Um, well, it, it wasn't an information request so much as a written inquiry for information regarding the reimbursement or payment of living expenses. Um, it, it's in the, it's in the, my request, my written inquiry is in the agenda. Um, basic terms of all severance agreements, uh, detailed accounting of all funds reallocated by the city manager in 2023 pursuant to section 20 of our AO bylaw, staff turnover statistics, city manager and managing director itemized expenses and P card statements for 2023. I made this inquiry so that the information would be provided for discussion at an open meeting and that information um, would be uh, available for discussion. Um, obviously the information has not been provided. Um, my understanding from reply emails I received from my email that uh, from the city manager and council that there is opposition to the provision of the information. However, again, my intention was not to ask for council's permission to receive the information because I, as I will indicate, I believe I am entitled to the information. Um, rather it was so that we could discuss the information and it could be made uh, the subject of pu public scrutiny, which is consistent with the principles of good governance, including financial governance, ensuring um, that administration, city administrator is fulfilling their responsibilities and the importance of Openness, transparency, in effect, openness and transparency in effective government. government. Um, the importance of these principles is reflected in the MGA, Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, and the city's code of conduct. Um, section 153 of the Municipal Government Act said that, says that um, each counselor, counselor has a duty to obtain information about the operations or administration of the municipality from the chief administrative officer or person designated by the chief administrative officer. And 207C um, says that the chief administrator is responsible for advising and informing the council on the operations and affairs of the municipality. Uh, Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act says that um, a disclosure of personal information is not an invasion of a third party's personal privacy if, um, this is 17.2e, the information is about the third party's classification, salary range, discretionary benefits, or employment responsibilities as an officer. 
employee or a member of a public body or as a member of staff of a of the staff of a member of the executive council f the disclosure reveals financial and other details of a contract to supply goods or services to the public body and h the disclosure reveals details of a discretionary benefit of a financial nature granted to the third party um, by a public body um, in my view i am because of this, I am entitled to receive the information as they are financial information, it's financial information. And uh, the information would be publicly avail available and publishable by any of them, any member of the public through a Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act request. Um, I think it would be relatively strange if the mayor was entitled to less information than a member of the public. Um, pursuant to um, freedom of information and protection of privacy. Uh, in any event, I'm not sure why the request for this information would be um, contentious. I, I'm not assuming that anything would be untoward in the documents, and I, I would find any assumption in that nature a that it would that would harm someone just disclosing what the expenses were. I mean, we disclose our expenses. I would never feel like if, if they're my expenses, why I would feel that that would harm me because I should be able to justify my expenses. Um, we are coming up to budget, and um, we are responsible for the finances of our organization. We are also responsible for establishing bylaws and policies and ensuring our bylaws and policies are appropriate and implemented appropriately. Um, for example, how can we properly evaluate our travel and expenses policy or any policy with respect to employee living expenses, um, whether they're sufficient or how funds are being reallocated by the city manager pursuant to section 20 of our AO bylaw if we don't have the necessary information to evaluate that. Um, in my view, the information is clearly concerned with the finances of the city, whether our policies are sufficient and or being properly implemented. And nothing in the AO bylaw or procedure bylaw um, or the MGA requires any counselor or council as a whole to just blindly trust. And um, uh, the, the Office of Information, the OIBC has said that the purpose of um, subsection 17.2H of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act is to ensure that the presence of personal information in a record does not prevent a public body from being accountable for the discretionary payments it makes to third parties. Interpreting this pr provision as encompassing, in this case that was being discussed, settlements, aligns with this objective. Um, so, in addition to that, it, to the extent that the information does include personal information or financial information of a third party, um, this information could be redacted in accordance with the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Thank you, Mayor Clark. The one thing I want to make known is as we continue forward, we cannot continue past 11 without a motion to continue past 11. So we will need a motion to continue this conversation. Oh, yes, of course, Councilor Robbins. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm not making a motion to stay past 11 just in case anyone was <clears throat> muttering about why, if I would, I'm not going to. Um, Mayor Clark, it's clear to me that you read from material, and I know when I did a notice of motion, I provided the material to council in advance so we could review the two notices of motions I had in the background and why I was requesting them. I'm wondering if you could provide us the written information that you've prepared, and that will be give us, at least me, I can't speak for everybody else, at least it would give me a better opportunity to respond and think about what your request is. So if, if that could be provided, it would be very very helpful for me to understand better and have a more fulsome discussion of it. Mayor 
Mayor Clerk, are you um, opposed in any way to providing the context of your request? I am not, but I am opposed to me having to come to council and ask permission for information that I'm entitled to and any member of the public is entitled to, but I am happy to provide the background and I would like to make a motion to complete this item extending the meeting to 1115. We do have one other item on the agenda too. It's first reading of the- uh, Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I understand that. So we've got, we have one minute to uh, second and approve the request. Otherwise, this will be uh, postponed until the next open meeting. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to say, to be honest, I think we would have got this completed, but we moved the uh, agenda around. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't think there's any anybody's intention, um, but I, I'm not going to extend this meeting because I think that we have absolutely could have got this done today. But we chose to move the agenda, so there's, um, in all fairness, there's just consequences to that. And I, I can't literally have a good conversation anymore, any longer. I, I, so I have a responsibility while I'm sitting at this table to be somewhat coherent and I'm losing the will to live, so no. Point of order, it's 11. Okay, yes, go ahead quickly. And just one quick adjourn. question too. I would like a opportunity to respond. Some of the things, really clearly fall under the purview of the city manager, and that's why they're not being brought forward. But I look forward to a more fulsome conversation about this. Thank you. Okay, with that, we will, do we have to um, vote on postponing these items, or do they naturally get postponed? Okay, so these items will be discussed. I would recommend the being some of the first items on the next open agenda so that we can deal with them immediately. And um, with uh, no further business, we will adjourn the meeting. <laughs>